So uh, we're here at the Computer History Museum. It's June 4th, 2019. I'm Doug Fairbairn, and I'm interviewing uh, Harry L. Tredenick, otherwise commonly <laughs> known as Nick Tredenick, and uh, he's played a major role in a variety of different uh, computer and semiconductor related activities over the past uh, several decades, and we're here to discover <laughs> the details of those. So Nick, welcome, glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Doug. So we always start out these uh, interviews with uh, just going back to the very beginning, where you were born, what, what your family life was like, uh, who were the people or activities or things that influenced you or steered you in a certain direction. So let's just start there. Where were you born? When were you born? And uh, oh my gosh. what was the <laughs> okay, well, what I was, was born life like? June 6, 1946. Oh my gosh, we're coming up on a birthday here. <laughs> yeah, two days, I'll be 73. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was in Schenectady, New York, of all places, and that's because my parents were World War II vets. They were in the Army, both of them. My mother was a nurse, and my dad was a Signal Corps officer, and they met in the Pacific and got married. And, had a bunch of kids and uh, came back to Schenectady, New York, where the, he worked for General Electric. And so he, he worked for General Electric from the end of World War II until he retired, 43 years. And so he's like, well, you can't hold a job, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way it was then. So yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what type of job did he have? Was he... Uh... He was, he, I'm not sure exactly what he did in Schenectady, but he was in the apparatus sales division eventually, so he sold things like street lights and turbines to, mm -hmm. he was an electrical engineer, he had a bachelor's degree from oh, okay. Cornell University, and, and then, uh, So he was war. from New York? He was, uh, No, he was from Pennsylvania, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. In fact, we had a bunch of relatives that were killed in the Johnstown flood. Wow. But they were, yeah, Johnstown. And my, both my parents were only children, and so they're like, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> so so that many, was no fun. How many siblings so, are there? So I have four brothers and two sisters, and wow. then we had two foster kids with, with us kids plus part two, of the time. Huh? So, yeah, we had plenty. Of, I had an older sister and a whole bunch of younger brothers and, and a younger sister. So, so does that, that mean you had uh, responsibility for... Looking at looking out for these younger siblings. To well, keep track definitely. I mean, we can you imagine? I mean, you have your the first one was born in June of forty five, June of forty six, uh, May of forty seven, and October of forty eight. So when you have the fourth kid, the okay. oldest one is three years old. So I, yeah, I was changing diapers probably when I was six. <laughs> <And> <laughs> So, so what did you do as a kid? You just play outside and have fun and you crowds or what was you your... You know, it's been too long since I was a kid, but having all those brothers and sisters, there was never any, never any boredom mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, we were, of course, my mom was an army sergeant. I mean, I don't think she was literally a sergeant, but that's how she ran the household, you know, so everybody had... We had a weekly work list and a daily work list and a you know rotation of jobs and and plus she cooked out of an army cookbook and there was nobody taking seconds so I don't have any fat brothers and sisters. <laughs> you really were raised in a military family, weren't you? <laughs> pretty, 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 well, my dad was a really easygoing guy, but my, not my mom. <laughs> So, so how long did you live in Schenectady? And, uh, so we moved out of Schenectady in 1951. Mm -hmm. We moved to Oklahoma City, and we were there from 51 to 61, and then we moved from there to o Abilene, Texas, which is just about the end of the world. It's, it's, it's flat, it's dry, it's West Texas. It's, you know, I tell people you can see just as many trees there as you can in places around here. It's just that that one's 13 miles away and that one's seven miles that way. <laughs> it's, so was your, your dad's job took you to that? Uh... Yeah, that was, that was a, re he drove all over Oklahoma when we were in Oklahoma City and then when we moved to Texas, I think he had West Texas, so he spent a lot of time because I think he sold primarily to the municip municipalities around there anyway. 
So did you, did his, the uh, fact that he had an electrical engineering background uh, influence you in any way in terms of the well, path you took? Or? Yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I've sort of bungled my whole way through life all the time. I mean, I never <clears throat> really knew what I was doing. And so electrical engineering was kind of just a, I mean, my science fair project was a radio one time and a telephone dialer another time. And <clears throat> but he don't, I don't think he cared what I majored in. And, and I didn't really know what I was going to major in. I didn't know anything about electrical engineering or any of that stuff. And I'm the only, of all the siblings, I'm the only one that was even in any kind of engineering. Mm -hmm. So the rest of them went off and did other things like accounting or food service or teaching, mm -hmm. but, but no more engineers. I think they figured one was enough, you know? <laughs> So in going to high school or whatever, were there any teachers that steered you in a particular direction or anybody that... Uh... No, I, I had, like everybody, you know, you can always remember your first grade teacher and your fourth grade teacher and thing, you know, occasionally things mm -hmm. like that. But I wouldn't say, there was, there was my geometry teacher was, a, was an interesting guy, you know, <laughs> he's a guy where, you know, you come into class one minute late and he says, there are lots of reasons, but no excuses, you know. <laughs> So he was a very, very interesting guy, and he made, I mean, geometry was fun for me. Math was fun. I was in the math club. I was in the, uh, what they call numbers sense, where you do these calculations for time and compete with other schools. And, but I, now, now, this is kind of an interesting thing, too, and I, I think it was partly driven by economics and partly who knows what, but logistics, I think. But none of us, well, so, so actually there are two sets of kids, right? They're the kids that are all bunched together and they're kind of a family. And then there are the late arrivals. And so the late arrivals are kind of special, you know? So I have, a, I have one brother who's an only child and one sister who is kind of an only child. And so they got different considerations from the rest of us. But the, the bulk of us, my dad, in, if you go to his college, whatever they call those yearbooks, mm -hmm. He played everything. He played football, basketball, <laughs> baseball. You know, he, he was the consummate athlete. Well, I think somehow that was enough for him. They didn't want any of us playing football or doing any of that stuff. And, you know, when he got old and had to use a shopping cart to walk around, <laughs> you know, then I kind of maybe understand why, but I think it was more a logistics problem than anything else, you know, well, and, and plus a, an affordability yeah. issue, you know, can't afford to sponsor all these kids doing sports and, and then having to shuttle them all around. So you got seven kids, you just can't do that. And so they basically said no. So none of us played any sports until the only children came along and then mm -hmm. One of them, the, the, my, we call her Buckwheat, but my sister's name is Mary. But anyway, <laughs> she played tennis. So she's the only family jock. <laughs> Happens to be a girl. <laughs> she's Buckwheat so, from the Little Rascals or something? Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we still call her Buckwheat. In fact, my dad called her Buckwheat. <laughs> so, <laughs> she signs her letters that way. I just got a birthday card from her <laughs> so, anyway so not much memorable for me through high school I, I worked in the cafeteria at, at the school because as I said my mom was not a good cook and actually one of the weekly rotating assignments was making the lunches for everybody for the next day right. and so I didn't want any part of that so I worked in the cafeteria at school to get food so, it came time to go to college. How did you, uh, was it always obvious you were going to college? What was the... Yeah, I think every single one of us, in fact, all of my brothers and sisters graduated from college, have at least one degree from college. So, it was, you know, my mom's like, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, well, yeah, it was always just assumed that we would go to college or you'd, you'd be a ditch digger or something. Of course, I, I do more of that now. Than <laughs> you 
do it by choice, huh? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's part of the thing. Well, one of my hobbies is kind of recreational landscaping, but I live out in the middle of nowhere, and there are 10 families on the road, and we do our own road maintenance, so I do as much ditch digging as I... Anyway, we all decided to go to college, and, and I... So she said... Um, well, they said, you know, get into a good college, we'll figure out how to pay for it. And so I applied to a bunch of good colleges. And I got into Cornell, for example, and, and soon I got the acceptance and they go, how are you gonna pay for that? And, and I, I'm like, well, you, you, <laughs> you said. said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they, they said, well, we can't afford that. And so my grandmother stepped up and said, well, I, I mean, I'll pay for it. <laughs> And so they said, no, that wouldn't be fair unless you're going to pay for college for everybody. And so, so I couldn't go to Cornell. And so, so I ended up going to Texas Tech, which is where my sister had gone. Mm -hmm. And then after that, one of my brothers went to Texas Tech and another brother went to Texas Tech. And eventually another sister ended up there for her <laughs> master's degree, I think, or no, I think she was... I, I don't remember. She was there for a while too. But anyway, so I went off to Texas Tech, and and basically, this is a story from my this is my brother's line, not mine. But but he says, you know, when I graduated from high school, <laughs> my parents gave me a toothbrush and a suitcase. <laughs> we wish you well. And yeah, we wish you well. So basically, their attitude was, we'll help the girls, but, but the guys are on their own. Yeah. And so Interesting. they subsidized the girls, and we were on our own. So I worked my way through college. I uh -huh. basically went off to Texas Tech. I got a job in the dorm cafeteria for 20 hours a week, and had another one at the student union for 25 hours a week. And I started majoring in electrical engineering. And, and I'm going through school and I'm thinking yeah I kind of like math I don't I don't think I'm really an electrical engineer and so I and then I found out about schools you know there's like a school of electrical or school of engineering and a school of arts and sciences and yeah. so then I I'm like okay well so if I want to major in math I've got to go change into the school of arts and sciences and I went over to the do that and it turned out there was a line like well you can imagine I mean this was fall of 64 65 somewhere in there so well, everybody's going to college and and everybody dives out of engineering <laughs> pretty soon after they get there and so i looked at the line and i thought well i'll come back next semester and i just never ended up getting back the next semester to do that so so i ended up majoring in electrical engineering and graduating in electrical engineering and I, I actually had a plan. I wanted to go right through a PhD. I didn't want to stop, mm -hmm. but I wasn't able to do that. What happened was I got a bachelor's degree, and actually, I should say, I set the performance standard for my class in electrical engineering. I had a, the department chair was, was uh, well, who's a good, or dictator type guy I mean he was an authoritarian he and he taught all the freshman courses because he's like I'm gonna I'm gonna f filter this group out and and when I say I set the performance standard I think he looked at me and said if you can't do it at least as well as that guy you're not gonna be here next semester <laughs> So I kind of squeaked through the undergraduate program, partly, I think, because I was working a 45-hour yeah, week. Yeah, it and, sounded like you had a full-time job anyway. So. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, so then I, I stayed at Texas Tech for a, a master's degree, mm -hmm. but my intent was not to stay for a master's. I was just going to keep going. To In fact, I wanted to become a professional course evaluator. I kind of liked taking courses. Not that I did well at them, but, but just because I just enjoyed you it. You didn't like and learning, huh? Yeah, yeah. I like, well, I, I can't really say I learned anything because my brain is just a sieve. You know, things just, I, you know, I, I, so, so I do Audible. I listen to books all the time, and I was looking at my Audible list. I've, I've listened to in the last 10 years, maybe a thousand books. Mm. 
I can't remember, and they're all, except for two, I think, n nonfiction, I, a science, astronomy, and, you know, any top. But, but it's like I can't tell you anything from any of that. None of, I mean, it's just, my brain doesn't work like this. <laughs> so so that's, that's actually, my wife is wonderful, <laughs> and I married her because she's, a, she's like my repository of all the, when we go to the doctor, you know, the dermatologist, for example, she can recite my entire medical history for the person. <clears throat> and so it works for things like, and, and I take her to events because she's like, hey, that's Doug Fairbairn. <laughs> So I don't have to actually remember it, <laughs> but but so so I actually graduated kind of on time. I mean, I graduated in four years, yeah. and the program at the time I went through was 145 course hours. Nowadays they're like 120 hours, mm. but it was a 145 hour program. They changed catalogs while I was there and brought it down to like 140 hours or something. But that was four full years, yeah. and two summer sessions. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I couldn't, I had to go work in the summers, but I did stay for at least one summer. I don't think I stayed two summers, but I, I did manage, well, I say I managed to graduate on time, but I, I, I had to take 21 hours some semesters, which was a That's pretty killer. good course load. With a 40 hour work and, schedule Yeah, I mean, well. working, working 45 hours a week plus the full course. So turns out sometime during that experience, I had to fill out some kind of form that told how much time you were working and what courses you were taking and stuff. And I just filled it out. You know, I'm a, I'm a moron. I, I mean, I just, I, I don't understand what's behind all this stuff. So I just fill out the form and they go, you can't be a full-time student and work 45 hours a week. So okay. Um, uh, what do you want me to do? I mean, how many hours can I work and still be a full-time student? And it turns out the answer to that is, I think, 43 or something. I don't, I don't know what the number is, but so I, I basically just had to say, because I couldn't afford to be part-time, I had to get out. And anyway, so I, I graduated, go, but this is 1968. It's the peak of the Vietnam War. I was about War. to say, this is Vietnam War time. This the Vietnam time. War time. So my choices are, I want to go, I want to go to finish, I want a PhD. But I have to either get a defense-related deferment by going to a Texas Instruments or some defense deferment place. Well, I go, is there any rule against joining ROTC as a graduate student? Turns out, no. So I joined ROTC, which got me two more years because now I'm in the two-year program for ROTC and I'm the only graduate student in the program. <laughs> but I know I'm going to get a commission because, <laughs> because I've already got the degree. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to decide what to do and you know what service do I go into. And so I, I go talk to the Army because I think Corps of Engineers, my parents were both in the Army. I should do that. So I go down to the, I don't know what they call them, the military science desk mm -hmm. at Texas Tech, and I walk into the Army office and I stand in front of this sergeant and I stand there for like a half hour and he never even looks up. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't want to go to the Corps of Engineers. Maybe I'll go see what the Air Force is doing. And so I walk down to the Air Force office and I go, I don't know anything about you guys, but uh, you need any engineering guys. And the guy says, uh, no, no, we don't really need engineers. That's actually we do, but it's competitive. But if you want a guaranteed slot, all you got to do is agree to become a pilot. I go, I don't know squat about airplanes. I never even thought about flying an airplane. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll do that because it's a guarantee. So it turns out that at the time I signed up for, is this stuff okay? Yeah, I mean, yeah, is, yeah this is good so, stuff. So at the time I signed up for it, they had discovered that if they paid for you to get a private pilot's license, it was cheaper to find out whether you're gonna wash out a pilot training. So, so there are like nine pilot training bases 
for the Air Force. And it costs a certain amount of money to move you from point A, wherever you graduated from school, to wherever the training bases are. And at that time, they had training bases in oh, places like Lubbock, Big Spring, Del Rio, Laredo, Columbus, Mississippi, uh, Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio, um, Williams, I think. I, I don't remember. Anyway, there were a bunch of them all over the United States, mostly in Texas, and there was one right there in Lubbock. But it turns out that it costs, I don't know, thousands of dollars to move somebody's family to a place like Laredo, and then if you flunk out of pilot training, they send you to supply school or something, and at that time, the dropout rate in pilot training was probably, I don't know, for my class, it was 50% or so. And so they figure, well, if we pay for pilot private pilots training lessons, then that's about, at that time, I think it was under $1,000. And the probability that you could graduate from pilot training, if you could fly at all, uh, was much higher, and they could actually save money. So, that, so I was taking private pilots lessons as an ROTC student, taking graduate courses, and I'm still working in the dorm cafeteria, and I'm working in the, in the um, student union in the pool hall, actually. And, and it was kind of a good deal to work in the dorm cafeteria because I had no money. And I mean, when I say no money, uh, it's to the extent that I was, I couldn't buy soap, for example. I'd go into the shower and collect all the scraps and make my own soap together. bars. <laughs> so because I worked in the cafeteria, I had access to cracked glasses. So I could take a cracked glass and fill it with soap scraps and then I could break it out from around and now I have a bar of soap. So soap was, and, and meals were a big issue for me too because while I was living in the dorm, they fed us 20 times a week. So the only meal I didn't get was Sunday dinner. And, and it was fine for that. And, uh, but when I became a graduate student, I could no longer give, live in the dorm. So I had to find a, actually rented a room from someone for like 30 bucks a month or I don't even know if it was that much but I think it was thirty dollars a month and and then because I was working in the cafeteria I could buy meal tickets and so I bought 35 cent meal tickets and so I figured I could get by if I could eat one meal a day and there used to be people that would come to watch me eat just because. Because <laughs> you ate so much for yeah, that one meal. Tradenic's huh? going to eat. <laughs> so, come and watch me eat. Anyway, so I started, I, I spent two years as graduate student and again working my way through. And then, and then what happened at that time was I kind of got caught up in the flying thing. It was okay. Not that I'm a competent pilot or anything, but, but I like the sensation. I like sightseeing, and, you know. And so, so then I applied for a three-year deferment because I wanted to finish a PhD, and, and the deferment came in, and they, oh, and, oh, I know what happened. I'm going to get the sequence right, or a little maybe scrambled, but you'll get the idea in a minute. What happened at the end of that period was I was about to be commissioned as an officer with a potential to go to flight school, and but I had to go take a flight physical. And so I went and took a flight physical, and I flunked the eye test. Well, at that time, they were not taking anybody that didn't have 20-20 vision. And so they said, well... Forget flying, you know, you can go to, you can have your three-year deferment to finish your PhD, but you're not going to be able to fly. So they paid for your flight training before testing whether you could actually fly. Well, I may, have, I may have passed an eye test, but I don't think so. But I never wore glasses. I didn't know I couldn't see. I mean, my, our parents didn't take us to the doctor, right. Right. you know. So I actually, I hurt my knee one time when I was a kid, I tore a ligament or something, and, and I couldn't, Every time I tried to take a step in a forward direction, I'd just fall over, and it was kind of painful. So I was walking around backwards for like three days, and finally they go, well, I don't think this is going to heal itself. They took me to the doctor, and 
end up wearing a hip cast for six weeks or something. Anyway, so we just never went to the doctor. So I, I got to school not knowing whether I could see or not. I just assumed everybody's vision was about the same. <laughs> anyway, so I flunked the eye test and I went to see the military science guy there and he said, hey, um, I think I can get you a waiver to get in pilot training if you dump the three-year deferment and go in right now. And so I said okay to that. And so I, I thought this shouldn't be a big issue because Reese is a pilot training base. I'm in Lubbock. Why would they move me anywhere? You know, I'll just go through pilot training in, at Laredo, I mean at Reese. Well, so they, they accepted me. But they sent me to Reese, I mean to Laredo. Laredo is, I think, a thousand miles from Lubbock. So, so I learned in the Air Force that the, the, that the military service and, and well, actually we'll get into military service stuff because I think that's an interesting part of my career. <laughs> <laughs> but but we don't let judgment interfere with procedure. <laughs> and the procedure is you toss the dice and send this guy somewhere, even if there's a pilot training base right next door. <laughs> so a thousand miles down to Laredo I go. And so so you see Laredo in a lot of Western movies and, and I lived on a dirt street in Laredo and I think the only misrepresentation there is that the streets aren't actually as wide in the real Laredo as they are <laughs> in the movies. But it's definitely out in the middle of nowhere. But that's good because if you're out with a bunch of student pilots, I was class 7108. And you can always tell with somebody who went through pilot training, nobody ever forgets their class number. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And I think we started the class with about 90 people and graduated about 46. Mm -hmm. And they, it's a fairly rigorous program, it's 53 weeks. What were you flying? Well, in pilot training, you fly basically a Cessna 172 for the first six weeks or so. Oh, just light aircraft. Transition yeah. into a, what, this thing called the 6,000 pound dog whistle. It's a T-37, it's a low wing Cessna yeah. jet, twin engine jet. And then you move into the supersonic T-38. And so you fly two and four ship formation, aerobatics and all that stuff. Back in those days, now they may have changed pilot training since then. And I was the, I graduated from pilot training in 53 weeks, so I got there I think in May of 70, and I graduated in May or June of 71. And I was the number one graduate academically, but as far as flying, not number one. <laughs> but it wasn't bad, I was about in the middle of my class, and so, what happens, at least in those days when the airplane assignments came out, the number one guy in the class got first choice of what to fly. And then typically the first, the very top guys in the class, and the mix of airplanes could vary a lot class to class. But a lot of times the top guys, well, Again, this is something that changes over time, but at the time I was going through, the top slots went to either fighter guys, so they'd take a fighter airplane. The top guy in my class took an F-106, I think it was, which is an air defense fighter. So the, the two choices for the top guys were either T-707, which was the KC-135 tanker because we called it a T-707 because that's what the airlines were flying. If you want to become an airline pilot, you go fly the multi-engine, you know, uh, KC-135, is that KC what they were? KC-135 is what I remember. Yeah, the tankers and then the, the C C-141 transports. Mm -hmm. I chose, I, I kind of looked at two, one was uh, uh, what they called the bullshit bomber, which was the light airplane that they flew over North Vietnam, throwing pamphlets out, telling people we were winning the war or something. And then uh, 
C-130, and I chose C-130. <clears throat> so I had orig my original assignment was a PACAF C-130 to Vietnam, uh, it, but it, at 71, they were just starting to wind down Vietnam, so they, that assignment was changed at the end of, before I left for Vietnam, it was changed to a, a TAC C-130 to um, Tactical Air Command to, to uh, Fayetteville, Pope Air Force Base, which is a suburb of Fort Bragg in North Carolina. So I went to Little Rock, Arkansas to train in C-130s for I don't know how long. And then I went to uh, jungle survival and sea survival. And <clears throat> so I've seen all the survival schools and E and A, E and all that. And then went to Pope Air Force Base where basically we had a lot of pilots but not too much flying to do. <clears throat> And because there were people coming back from Vietnam, well, actually, this is a pipelining problem, right? I mean, you got, you've got a 53-week program training pilots, and so you start a class every six weeks, and, and they keep coming out of the pipeline at the rate you put them in until somebody says, hey, you know, maybe we don't, we're not killing so many pilots anymore. <laughs> They're starting to come back from Vietnam. Let's shut this off. And so then they take fewer inputs, but then you've still got right. this huge output coming yeah. out, plus the people coming back. And so it turned out the pilot squadrons were highly overmanned at that time. And How so, long were you in the service before you went back? Uh, you, got, you finished your master's degree yeah, before finished, you went into the service. Yeah, and then when I went in the service, I, I didn't do anything but pilot training when I was in pilot training. Once I got out of pilot training, I started a, an MBA program, night school thing, while I was in the squadron at, in North Carolina. And I was only in for active duty for 25 months. And then they said, hey, uh, we're doing this thing called Palace Chase, a Palace Chase program. If you can find a reserve unit that will take you, we'll let you out early with a two-for-one obligation. So at the time, and maybe this isn't relevant or anything, but at the time, uh, if you went through, if you were just a regular officer in the Air Force or Army, you had a four-year commitment. If you went through pilot training, it was a five-year commitment. Now I think it's six years or something. Yeah, but, yeah. but from the time of graduation, and so from the time of my graduation, I had a five-year commitment in the service. And then... They said, well, we need to get rid of some pilots, so if you can find a reserve unit that'll take you, we will let you out of the service now and just we'll double your commitment in the reserves to a maximum of six years. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, well, let's see, I've been here a year. I got it. means I'd normally pick up an eight-year commitment in the reserves, but if I find a unit that'll take me, it'll just be, there's a six-year maximum. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I get out my encyclopedia and I start looking. I, I, make a list of the universities that I want to go to for PhD and I find the air bases close to them and I start interviewing air base you know people and see if they need anybody and I found a University of Texas was pretty high on my list for graduate school partly because I'm a Texas resident so I can get in-state tuition there I was like 50 bucks a month at that or 50 bucks a year or semester at that time for you know so it's like nothing Actually, I, while I was at Texas Tech, I was a, a teaching assistant, research assistant, and I was maintaining a CDC 1604 there. So that was kind of my first hands-on experience with computers. And that was one that had Mylar tape, and you know the boot program was on Mylar, and yeah. <laughs> it was very. So you had to learn all the time, right? <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, and we had tape machines that ran on vacuum pumps and stuff and had these big Thyrotron power supplies, and we maintained all that, replaced the transistors on the boards. and So I got a little maintenance experience doing that. Anyway, back to this pilot stuff. I came back, uh, I, I looked at the schools I might want to go to and University of Texas is right up there and there was a turns out they were flying C-130s out of uh, Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio which is like 85 miles from Austin. <clears throat> I went down and talked to those guys and 
they had been flying something else, C-123s or something that just transitioned into C-130s needed pilots. Go, okay, well, they'd take me. <laughs> so I, I exited the service, got into the reserves, and it turned out that, that it was a very nice time to do that because it turned out that the Air Force was moving all of its transport uh, requirements to the reserve programs because it was like a fifth the cost of having active duty people hauling what we call trash hauling, mm -hmm. hauling trash around the United States. And so I got into the unit just as they were levying really heavy requirements on the reserve units to, to do the, to basically haul uh, cargo around the United States. And so it turned out for the next 10 years, I averaged 195 days a year of duty with the Air Force. That's, that's a lot of... Yeah, I mean, it's not like you know, two weeks a year and, and a weekend a no, month. No, right. I mean, like it's that, not, right? not two weeks a year and a weekend a month. Basically, they sent out a schedule every month <clears throat> that said, here are all the flights we need to cover this month. Just circle the ones you want or circle of ones you're eligible for. <clears throat> and we had, we had basically in that squadron, we had three types of guys mainly. We had students, well maybe it was four. We had, we had students like me, graduate students. There's a guy who was uh, working on a PhD in uh, what did that call? Uh, astrophysics or something anyway. Uh, and then we had guys that were lawyers. We had a lot of lawyers because they have flexible hours. We had a lot of airline pilots because, again, they work 10 days a month or something and draw a full paycheck, and, you know, here's recreational flying for them. And then we had guard bums, you know, guys that just really didn't do anything else. And we had one guy who was a veterinarian, and he lived out of his car. He was a, a substitute vet, you know. So when another veterinarian goes on vacation, he takes over his office and basically these guard bums as we call them just spent their time flying pretty much full time for the so do you get you get paid for this time in the service in the oh yeah yeah and, we did so what were you doing when for the other 150 days a year other than well i was a full-time student taking courses as a phd candidate okay. and i also had a uh, I so was what a, were you this is a phd candidate in electrical engineering yeah, I was in electrical engineering, and it, and so. <laughs> and were you focused on any? I mean, this is early '70s, so. Yeah. So, so there. Any particular area that you were focused in? Or? Well, it turned out, if I look at the courses that I ended up taking, it was terrible because, because I had done the same thing at Texas Tech because I was trying to get into a PhD. Thing, and they say, you need to take courses in four of these six areas. Mm -hmm. And so I'm taking computer courses and quantum mechanics and this and this. And I get to Texas and they go, well, you need to take courses in four of these six areas. And I said, I just did that over here. And they said, yeah, but you're at University of Texas now and you're gonna have to take <laughs> courses in four of these six areas. So I ended up with way more hours than I needed. But, but and, and unfortunately I wanted my, I wanted to major in computing and logic design because, in my opinion, that's the simplest of the electrical engineering disciplines because it makes sense, you know. I mean, but I took more courses in quantum mechanics and, and uh, these esoteric topics because I'm doing these four of these six areas things and, and I'd already done that once before and so I ended up, I, these, I know nothing of any of those topics anymore, but antenna theory and quantum mechanics and, but really my interest was digital logic design. So let's move along on the engineering side. So you were at the university, what, you didn't actually get a PhD, is that right? No, I did get a oh, PhD. Oh, you did get a PhD. Yeah, I worked for a guy named Terry Welch there. Okay. And in fact, I went into, you, you have to choose an advisor, right? So I went in and talked to him and I'm like, he was a, an MIT PhD, and he was one of the guys that's in looking at computing stuff. Mm -hmm. They go, I'm kind of interested in, you know, I really want to get a PhD, but I want, 
he, he says, well, you're going to have to demonstrate competence in something. And I said, well, how about incompetence? And he says, been done already. I said, okay, well, um, I, I don't know. Let's, I kind of like this computer stuff. And we kind of settled on a topic. And I said, okay, but I want the all-time rubber stamp committee. I want, I want people that aren't even going to look at my thesis. You know, I, I just, you know, help me with that anyway. You know? <laughs> and he was, he was an, an excellent supervisor. I mean, I, I think he was. I don't know. I was, the, I was the only guy that ever got a Ph.D. under him. And he had lots of candidates, I think, but I, I'm not sure. I think I wore him down as so well. So what did you get your Ph.D.? I mean, what was your thesis? Fun. My thesis was on the implementation of variable word length arithmetic. Mm -hmm. And I started out actually, I was, I was a teaching assistant, or research assistant as a graduate student, and I was flying with the military, and I was taking courses, and I was working on a, this PhD thing. And I started out doing, actually, the University of Texas, the reason that Texas Tech had a 1604, CDC 1604, was that the University of Texas had bought a CDC 6600. Mm. And so the cast off then went to one of the second Lesser tier school. schools <laughs> for the, from a money perspective, because at that time, the university available fund was 100% University of Texas. I don't know how the Texas A&M managed to get in on that, but now those two schools kind of share that. Which so is what year did you get your PhD? 1976. Okay. And so. you were still in the um, reserve flying bunch? And yeah. So and what I, did you decide to do at that point? Well, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like I said, I've never been a guy that knew what I was going to do. And so I took a job as an assistant professor at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it'll give me a year or so to kind of look around and figure out what I want to do. And during that year, I'm teaching classes as an assistant professor, and it's the biggest office I ever had. That office was larger than this room. <laughs> it was, I mean, it's the, I think it's the best office I ever had. <laughs> and I don't know, I, mean, I guess, oh, partly I think it was because the way that the funding worked at the school was that they could, they could buy buildings and but they couldn't, oh, yeah. it's, you know, some you, weird you thing. You have capital equipment budget, but you don't have any operational yeah, budget. They, yeah, 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 exactly. So, they, so they're paying me like 14 k a year or yeah. something as an assistant professor. And, and one day, Tom Gunner walks into my office and, and starts talking to me about what I do. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a computer guy. I like computer stuff. I've taught Fortran programming and uh, logic design and... and uh, the physics of semiconductors and things like that. And he's like, well, yeah, how would you like to work on a microprocessor design project? And what do you think it would take to get you? You know, you could you come over for like 40K or something? <laughs> I'm, and I laughed out loud because I'm, you know, I'm just a naive person and, you know, I'm making like 14 and he says 40. And I'm like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's <laughs> so Motorola. I might even be able to buy my own soap bars at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Well, actually, yes. I, I mean, I had actually glycerin soap at that time because <laughs> I'm signing up for all the trips to go to places like Puerto Rico and and Portugal and and Hawaii, and I'm traveling all over the place for the military. For the military. And when you go into a place like Lisbon or someplace in Portugal, you get glycerin soap for, I don't know, a nickel a bar or something. So I'm buying cases of soap. And anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay because I'm, I'm working, like I say, 195 days a year at the military. I'm a teaching assistant. I'm getting uh, veterans assistance because I've qualified for the VA benefits. And, and so I'm, I'm actually getting by and so is, was Tom there on a recruiting mission was he he I, I don't know what made him come into my office and start talking to me I think yeah I think he was recruiting mm -hmm. and so I signed up I I said sure I'll come over and so join you guys. The, the University of Texas is in what city what Austin yeah, it's in Austin which is where Motorola, which is where Motorola was, was. Okay. yeah that's so where Tom was at go the down time. the street or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. 
So you decided to move over to Motorola. What was and it was specifically to work on microprocessor design. Yeah, yeah. It was actually he, it was a project he was just starting, and he, he called it Max Motorola Advanced Computer System. That was the name of the project when we started on it. And my first assignment there, he said, I think we're going to have you do the on-chip cache. Well. If you know the 68,000, you know it doesn't have an on-chip cache. And, you know, at that time, it was, it was Tom's dream, you know, that maybe it would have an on-chip cache. And, and then he says, well, but we're not really ready for that yet, so why don't you start looking at the logic design and the execution unit, and, and when we get somebody competent to take that over, you can move off of that project. And how big was the team at this point? Uh, well, as far as logic designers or no, the whole I mean, team? On the, the, whole on the team? Max program. The, yeah. Well, so I don't know the real answer to that because I worked for Tom. And when I got there, John Zolnowski was there. He was a PhD in computational complexity from Stanford University. Uh, Skip Stritter was there. He had a PhD also from Stanford, and he had... He had uh, done a thesis on computer architecture of some kind. I think he basically looked at, he brought Len Schustick's thesis with him and that was, what was the basis for that plus the, I think PDP-11 was the basis for the 68,000 design. Les Crudell was there at that time, David Leach. I can't remember the other people. Richard Crisp was there sometime, but I didn't really mess with the circuit designers too much and I think, well, I don't know who was doing what. I mean, I, you know, so. quite a team between Skip and Les and yourself and. Yeah, I mean, he had. did amazing things. A bunch of PhD guys there and, and uh, basically I think Skip was writing the user's manual along with David Leach. And I worked primarily by myself and, and I shared a cubicle with John Zolnowski, and John is just a wonderful guy. I mean, I just, John is a tremendous guy, and he's really, really smart. And he was my go-to guy for anything. You know, the, to me, the magic of logic design is you take an English language description. I want this instruction to do A, B, and C. I want this instruction to do this and this and this. You take an English language description of the behavior of a machine and you turn that into physical transistors and you turn it into equations and transistors and that's, I mean, that's just a really gratifying experience for, for me personally. I, I just, that, that was, that was, I really enjoyed that job. So and was I, there, a, was there a, I mean, Motorola was in competition with TI and Intel and others at the time, was there pressure on this? Was this sort of a hobby? Was this a... Oh, it wasn't a hobby. No, <laughs> no, I, no. Is you, there a deadline so, you were working against? Well, so... <laughs> I'm at a low level in this organization. So, so Tom was... Tom was my interface to the world. Mm -hmm. So he took all the arrows from the p political fights and stuff, and he worked for a guy... Um, oh gosh, I've, his name's, I'm drawing a blank on it right now, and we were just talking about him yesterday because this last weekend was a big car show at Pleasanton, and Keith Diefendorf and I always go to these car shows, and it turns out Keith used to work for Les Crudell at Motorola, oh. and Les is, is in town this last weekend, and so I met with him, and the three of us went look at cars, and anyway, so I saw Les again, but... Uh, guy, what is that guy's name? I didn't like Gary Daniels. Oh, so yeah. Tom Gunner worked for D Gary Daniels, and and then and then Colin Crook was above him, I think. And Colin was the guy that made the decision to go ahead. And we were internally inside Motorola. The competition was more between the 6809, <clears throat> which was an advanced version of 6800, and the 68000. And so we weren't really looking at, I think at the same time Intel was doing that 
what was that crazy processor Intel did that was going to do floating point and... 432? The 432. And we kept hearing rumors about the 432 and how it was going to do floating point. And we heard about the 9900, I think it was, or maybe... TI. Was, mm -hmm. TI's 9900. And it was a memory-to-memory -memory architecture. And Tom would come in and say, well, you know, should we be doing memory-to-memory -memory architecture? And should we be doing this? And should we... Be but we didn't really feel much, I didn't feel much pressure on that. Now, maybe he was talking to Skip or somebody about that, but basically I was just doing the logic design. I was doing the, what's the block diagram? What's the configuration of the execution unit? How do you make that thing behave the way it's supposed to behave? So I was doing the, what we now call microcode, but really they were a bunch of PLAs. And so I did all the PLAs and transistor placement and minimization. And, actually the the entire instruction set map placing it in the design space i mean the first time i look at the user's manual i'm flipping through the thing and the register files are moving all over the place <laughs> wait a minute you can't move the register designators i gotta have <laughs> you know the registers have to be here and the opcodes have to be here and you know and so i that was actually one of the things I had to negotiate through. Who, was the who did the instructions at? So I, I want to say that it was primarily Skip and John and maybe David Leach, but I, I, you'd have to ask them. You know, I'm working from a document and, right. and I'm just trying to convert it into transistors. <laughs> and that was primarily my job. Now, after I had been there maybe a year, they hired Colleen Collins, who was just out of the University of Texas in electrical engineering. She was wonderful also, she's very smart. But she was, I basically gave her tasks to do helping me with the logic design microcode stuff. So what year did you join Motorola to work on this project? 1977. Okay, and how long, and you worked through completion of that program? Yeah, I worked through the end of that program till we had working parts, and I can remember the first working parts that came, well, they weren't quite working. They came back and we put them on the test, or Les put them on the test. Les was doing a TTO implementation oh, okay. in parallel with the rest of the design, and that was a hopeless task because the changes that, you know, I could make a change pretty quickly and right. cause huge problems for him. And this was, I think the Motorola 68000 was probably the last large pencil and paper design. So it was all yeah. hand layout, Everything. digitized and... Well, I don't know about the layout. I know about the logic design and the PLAs. I placed all the transistors and I minimized all the PLAs by hand. I did all of the, the logic equations where I had... Do you have any simulation tools? No, no simulation tools. There were, I think John uh, did a, we, we bought a deck machine for something during that course of that project. And, and so we kept documents on, I kept documents on, some documents on that. All my documents primarily were in pencil. But John did a program that simulated the multiply algorithm that I was using. And he found a, a loop in there that there was no way to get to, so it <laughs> helped optimize that a little bit, but basically the optimization techniques, the placement in the control store was all done pencil and paper. I had, I had basically IBM cards with each of the, of the microcode statements on it, and I, and I shuffled those cards to try to optimize things. I had a, I mean, it's going to sound unbelievable, but I had a 16 variable Carnot map that I used, and it was obviously truncated because there were don't cares in, in a lot of places, but you still had to carry it all the way to and whatever instruction could be defined by all 16 bits if you didn't have any register fields. And so I basically had a 16 variable Carnot map. And I, <laughs> so this is just some was of the Was there pressure on to minimize logic or, you know, what Well, yes, it? I mean, everything, we're, the transistor budget was absolutely the issue. You know, could we fit it? Could we put another register in? We couldn't, I mean, it was right down to the last transistor. And, mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> I remember one time when Tom says, 
hey, we need to do X, you know, and he just put a note on my desk, this has to change, which meant I had to replace everything in the control store. And I remember we're looking at this note and Colleen's standing next to me and she's reading this note and she looks at me and she says, are you gonna kill him? <laughs> because any change, you know, the, one of the problems with microcode is that you can compensate for errors in the logic that, that are much, it's, it's a sort of your, your avenue of first resort right. if you've got a layout problem. And so, yeah, I mean, there was, there was definitely an issue with minimization that was, that, that was, that was key to the whole project and being able to get it in there. And we were able to do that. So you got the, you got the thing done, you got it back when you were then involved in the debugging process? Yes, down. yes. So, yeah, I'm standing there with my flow charts, which are all on paper, and Everything, so this is part of dealing with Tom, because the first time Tom came to talk to me, he's pointing at something on one of my diagrams and he touches it. And I see this little smudge. I'm like, okay, Tom, that's the last time you're gonna see a pencil document from me, you know. We were doing blue lines at those time where you run it through and get yeah, this yeah. blue line. And so that was the last he saw the real documents. And then after that, everything he saw was a blue line. But so we took, um, Les was running the analyzer and bringing up the chip and we're watching the behavior and I, I'm a little hazy on how we were watching the behavior. But I'm sitting there with my flow charts and he's saying, okay, this is what this looks like. And I'm like, okay, well that means we got here and then obviously it jumped over to here somewhere. So something went wrong right there. And so it was a it was a less and me with a bunch of guys standing over our shoulders watching as as we're running, booting the the system up and trying to figure out what happened. And we were able to debug it that way eventually. It was very close even the first time. It ran a lot of a lot of stuff. I think the C6 register was both of them were tied to positive or something and. Tom said, yeah, that was my mistake. <laughs> I was here at <laughs> 3 o'clock in the morning doing layout, and that happened. And so, But, yeah, we were very successful. I think the J5H was the first chip, and R9M was the second one or something. And I, I don't remember the generations of, of chips after that, but it was basically pretty successful then. And, and I was there for a little while after that was completed because IBM came in and said, you guys think you can reprogram this thing since it's microcoded to do the 360 instruction set? And we go, hmm, yeah, we'll look at it. And so I ended up working with the guys in Endicott, New York, to do a 68,000 recoded to do 360 instructions. Yeah, so, so you ended the, the 68K was a successful program you went on to the next thing was working with IBM did you actually go work for IBM or did you um, well I worked on that project with the guys in Endicott but then but still as a Motorola employee as a Motorola employee okay. but then I my girlfriend at the time finished her PhD and so the two of us were looking for a job mm -hmm. and so we went and looked at a number of places I interviewed at at IBM Research, uh, Bell Labs, Carnegie Mellon, Berkeley, Sperry Research, uh, Motorola was on the list, and I forget, I think there were seven of them total, and they all made us offers. And so I'm looking at these offers, and unfortunately, the university offers were like half of the, of the industry offers. Oh, Intel was on that list, and the, and I got offers from everybody, and so now I'm trying to decide what to do, and and I unfortunately I didn't weigh weather heavily enough, and and I, I interviewed. This is something for any any young people that might listen to this. If you're doing a spreadsheet for how to make a decision, <laughs> don't interview in the springtime. So I. <laughs> 
<laughs> when everything looks good. <laughs> yeah, I'm driving the Taconic Parkway, and this looks, it's just a garden. I mean, it's just beautiful, you know, driving up the Hudson River in April or something. It's just gorgeous, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know, IBM's the number one computer company, and T.J. Watson Research is the top of the pyramid, and, you know, I'm, it's all geniuses, and if, if I can sneak in there somehow, maybe they won't notice, you know. Uh, you know, it's like, and so I, so I accepted that offer. And so I ended up moving to New York State for what I say is three summers and five winters. <laughs> Even though I, I know that's not possible, but that's what it felt like. <laughs> so, so I moved to New York and started working at with your girlfriend slash wife, or yeah, this? yeah, with my with my girlfriend, and and uh, she was, I think also, I don't remember. She was working for IBM too, I think, maybe even in research division. But I I I'm lost on that one now. But I I ended up working with a guy named Brian Shimamoto there. I was there, so so when I got there. I had seen a little bit of politics at Motorola, and I said, okay, I'm through with microprocessors. I don't want to do that stuff anymore. And I worked on fiber optic serial channel for about a year. And I'm finally... At Motorola? Yeah, no, at IBM. Oh, at IBM. Okay. IBM Research. So I'm a research staff member at IBM. Yeah. and I'm working for this little guy that I didn't really get along with very well. And I'm working with this guy, Brian Shimamoto, and Brian and I get along really well. And, and I start talking to him about microprocessors and stuff and what I'd really like to do. And let me, let me I, I don't want to back up too much, but I have to here because it's part of the story. And that's that when I got to Motorola, you remember Tom said, why don't you do some logic design until we find a competent person to do that? And so I started looking around, well, how am I supposed to do this? You know, there must be some books on logic design that tell me how to design a microprocessor, and there's nothing. And so when I'm interviewing at Bell Labs and IBM, I'm like, you know what I'd really like to do when I come here is I'd like to think about logic design. I'd like to, you know, there's a big design automation conference every year, and what are those guys automating? You know, I can't find a process that they're automating. So I'd like to come to a research place and, and document the design process that I used because I think it works pretty well. Mm -hmm. And if I can document that process, then I can turn that over to the design automation guys and they'll be, they'll be automating the things that I need to do the design <laughs> instead of whatever the heck it is they're doing over there. <laughs> and so, so I, I'm talking to Brian about this and finally we go, okay, well, let's, we'll just write that down. We'll, we'll do a practice design because I can't use the Motorola stuff. That's all confidential to Motorola, so we'll do a phony design and we'll just choose IBM 370 and we'll do a 370 design from scratch just as an example so I can write a book. And so we start working on that project. And then we get pretty far along and we go, well, how much credibility are we gonna have if this is just a phony design? You know, we probably ought to go ahead and try to make it a real design. And so the project kind of grew from there and and you, you ask for funny incidents and so I, there are a few of those that I have for this. I'm basically a loner, you know, I, I've, uh, all this diversity and teamwork stuff, uh, I think there are people that work fine in that environment but I'm not one of them. I just want to go do something. Give me a job and go do it. Yeah, I just want to, I want to solve this problem and then give me another problem and I'll go try to solve that one. So anyway, I'm, I'm plugging away at this design and we decide I need privacy. And so I go to my boss, we go to my boss and we say, I don't know if you know how Yorktown is laid out, but it's kind of a truncated donut. It's a, well, you know, Apple's spaceport, it's like, what do they call it, angel food cake. Okay, so you take a slice of angel food cake and the windows are all along the outside edge and then all the offices are, are spokes that go back from that. And we go to the, the boss and our manager, whoever that was, I don't remember now, 
and we say we'd like offices that are on opposite sides of the aisle in other words his office is on this aisle and you have to go around this way to get to my office <clears throat> And they're like, well, that's a, that's a little weird, given that you guys are working together on this project, but okay. So they give us offices that are on opposite sides of the aisle. And so we've got, there's basically, the offices are in pairs going down the, aisle, the spoke with kind of frosted glass windows on the outside edges and then lockers in the back. And so the lockers in the back are storage and that kind of thing. Well, we have offices on opposite sides, so I disassemble the back side of the locker, and now and then I lock my office and put up a sign that says, uh, I got a hold of one of those uh, strategic air command signs that says people that enter this are subject to, you know, radiation Being shot death. And yeah, yeah right. I mean, we'll torture you. and. <laughs> So I put that sign in the window, and, which is still readable through the frosting. And then I enter my office basically through Brian's office by opening the locker door and going through that. And so, <laughs> so nobody can find me. I'm working in the back room. He's the front office. <laughs> Except that one time he's in his office talking to somebody, and all of a sudden somebody comes out of the locker. <laughs> you know, so... Oh, and, and, you know, this, I mean, this is, this is the epitome of, you know, you think of it as the, the pinnacle, you know, they're, IBM's trying to corner the market on the world's geniuses or something, right? And so it's, but this is the epitome of, of conformance to qualifications. You know, if you, if you set your qualifications really high, then you get people that are good at showing those qualifications. But Brian and I aren't really kind of like that. You know, we're walking around, these people think pretty highly of themselves, and you look in their offices, and here's all these awards and diplomas and stuff. So what do we do in our office? Our wall, there's like nine high school diplomas. And they're, and they're all from Erasmus Hall High School in New York City. <laughs> but it looks kind of like everybody else's <laughs> office until you take a close look at it. <laughs> and we actually had people come in and they'd go, are you really all from Erasmus Hall High School? <laughs> no, but we did other things too. We, uh, we had a rubber stamp two rubber stamps that I can remember. One of them said for IBM external use only. <laughs> and so IBM is very careful about control of yeah, and documents, and, documents yeah. and yeah, I mean, confidential information and all that. So we had, we had a rubber stamp that said for IBM external use only. And if somebody starts talking to us, we go, well, are, you, are you an IBM employee? Because I can't disclose this to you if you're an IBM employee. This is for external use only. And we had another stamp that said, library copy, do not remove. And so all the trade magazines and stuff that we were throwing away, we'd stamp them, library copy, do not remove, before we put them in the trash, because the trash cans had to be outside your office at night because of this document control yeah. thing. They yeah. want all the offices locked. Yeah. People kept stealing our trash cans. And so what did we do? We chained our trash can to the door handle which got us in big trouble because the cleaning people thought we had some vendetta against them. And so they went to the high level people there and said, you know, look at what these guys are doing to us. And so, so, so did you get your book written? Actually, that's part of the story. So, so yeah, we did. We, um, yeah, it's called Microprocessor Logic Design. It was published by Digital Press. And, and a part of the story is I, I took a sabbatical leave to go teach at Berkeley for a year. And I actually have to back up a little bit because there's more to the story, unfortunately. This was, this was the risk era. Mm -hmm. You know, Dave Patterson and John Hennessy and all that risk baloney was going on. And so I'm sitting in my office one day and I get a call from Dave Patterson. And he knows I've done the 68,000, and it's kind of the antithesis of risk. And so he's like, 
why don't you come out to Berkeley and give a talk? And I'm like, well, okay, I'll come out and give a talk. But, but the title of my talk is going to be Why the Risk Chip is Junk. And there's a little silence on the phone for it. And then, and this is probably 1980 or 81. And 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 Dave Dave's a great guy too. He's I, I really like Dave. And so Dave's silent for a minute, and then he says, "Okay." I said, "You want me to send you an abstract for that?" And he goes, "I don't think I'm going to need an abstract for that." <laughs> So then I have to go to IBM to get permission to give the talk at Berkeley. Well, it turns out uh, IBM 801 is being I, done. I was about at, to say, what about John Cock and Yeah, the, John Cock and Marty Hopkins and all those guys are doing the 801. And, and Yorktown Heights, that building that we're in is building 801, which is where that name came from. And so... So for, IB, for, for IBM to give me permission to go out and give the talk at Berkeley, they want an abstract. So I write an abstract that's absolutely in keeping with the title of the, of the talk, and it gets rejected. This is unprofessional. You can't say this kind of stuff. And so I go round and round with them and finally end up with an abstract that they'll accept. And this doesn't have to go to Berkeley. This is just to right. get approval just, through just IBM. Just to get you on the airplane to Berkeley. Yeah, and <laughs> and so, so they go okay. Um, and then of course on my door I post the before and after abstracts. <laughs> anyway, they decide you're going to have to give that talk here first before you go to give it at <laughs> Berkeley. And so they originally schedule it in some conference room. But it's so controversial that by the time I give the talk, it's now scheduled in the auditorium. <laughs> and not only is it scheduled in the auditorium, they actually send, I don't know, some kind of special representatives to my talk to see whether it's sufficiently professional that I shouldn't be fired. You know, that it's not, you know, that do they have to fire me or can I actually go give this talk? The topic police, huh? But yeah, I mean, they're, they're seriously considering whether or not yeah. I, I should be allowed to do this. So anyway, I give the talk. The, Marty Hopkins brings a couple of slides onto the stage and wants to, <laughs> for rebuttal. And I'm like, Marty, come on. <laughs> just let me just finish my talk. <laughs> anyway, I ended up, I went and gave the talk at Berkeley, which was probably the first technical presentation at Berkeley to ever have protesters show up with signs, posters, you know, so <laughs> I actually had picketers in the back of the room. <laughs> but, and, and I don't know that I could dredge up the talk, but it was basically technical. And it was, and I, well, listen, I've written a lot of papers over the years because I wrote for Microprocessor Report. And so, you go back to my original papers on, on the risk chip. I, I think I wrote one entitled Year of the Risk, and maybe there was a second one, Year of the Risk Reprise or something. Anyway, that's basically the content of the talk. It says, you know, these guys make all these wild claims. It's, you know, <laughs> they're leading in two things, reported performance and publications. But if you look at who's leading in revenue, it's the CISCs. <laughs> and that's still true today. I mean, in fact, I did some consulting for some guys one time, and they said, you know, we're, we really have to do this risk thing. And I said, no, you, all you have to do is put that label on your machine. You don't have to actually do the risk thing. So anyway, to get back to the original question you asked about publishing the book, Dave and the guys at Berkeley invited me to come out to Berkeley and spend a, a, a sabbatical leave. And I also had an invitation from MIT, and by this time I know something about weather. <laughs> and so I'm going to Berkeley. So I'm, I come out to Berkeley and teach for a year, and that was a wonderful experience. I, I really enjoyed that. And I, 
In fact, Belleville Kahn came to a lot of my lectures. Every time I talked at Berkeley, I think he showed up at my lectures. I, and I was flattered by that. But anyway, I, I enjoyed it. I taught for a year, and I was writing the Were you text. teaching microprocessor design there also? Yeah, I was teaching microprocessor design at the undergraduate and graduate level mm -hmm. and, and working on this textbook. And I finally kind of finished the textbook. And, and of course, I was still an IBM employee, which, which is its own problem because Berkeley offers me a kind of a token salary, but they're sending me checks. And I send the checks to IBM because IBM is actually paying me. Well, of course, Berkeley is reporting to the California tax authorities that they're paying me this money. But IBM's not reporting to California tax attorney authorities that they're getting those checks, and I'm not actually cashing them. And so I ended up having to fight that for years, literally. Because I, well, anyway, that, it was... So, so you did that for a year and then went back and... Well, I didn't go back. I, this is another, another piece of the story. My, the guy that was my second level manager at IBM, I was actually managing the, the Micro 370 project at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to come out to Berkeley and, I, and he's like, well, um, wh what do you... I said, yeah, I'll, I want to go to Berkeley, but I think if I get out there, I'm not going to come back. And he says, well, I, I can't approve of your going out to Berkeley if you're not at least going to say that you're going to come back. And I said, well, <laughs> in all good conscience, I can't say that I'm going to come back. And he says, finally, he says, okay, you can go. But somebody else is going to have to take over the project. And so fortunately, Brian, the guy that I'd been working so Brian and I worked together. We hired a summer student named Lynn Lamb, and, and this is another one of those things where we're going through all these resumes of these prospective summer hires. And, and you know, they're all top of the class, A plus everything, recommendation letters, and we run across this one that's Lynn Lamb. And we don't know whether it's a boy or a girl, but it's not, you know, it's not top of the class, not this or, we go, I like this person, let's hire this person. <laughs> So we hire Lynn, and she's just a sweetheart, and she's smart, and she's, she's Vietnamese. She can't speak. I mean, you know, she's just learning English, so of course she's struggling in school. But she's a great employee, and, she, and she's still there 30 years later. That's not right. You know, so <laughs> I didn't go to her retirement ceremony, but the rest of the project people did. You know, I was on the West Coast, and they're all on the East Coast, but all of those people went to her retirement party. <laughs> so she's still there. Anyway, so, so the Brian, Micro 370 project become something? Yes, yes. It it actually booted VM, if you know what VM is. Yeah. So it became a now unfortunately for political reasons it didn't wasn't successful. I mean and and partly because it was done in research and there were competing projects that were spending real dollars and so you know, hey, we spent seven million dollars on this thing and so we're not going to take that piece of junk, you know, and so, so it was not, again, it's one of those things, I think it should have been the maintenance processor for every IBM processor, mm -hmm. because it's an instru compatible instruction set. Mm -hmm. I think their maintenance processors are some other instruction set. It doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, that's what they, it, it, we had, we had parts, we had working parts, we booted VM. But, but it was a research project, and so okay. we did get the book So you went and taught at Berkeley for a year, and then? Well, and then what I did was I looked around IBM offices in the local area, and I said, uh, uh, could you give me office space in your office? And, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'll, I'll do something. I'll work for you or with you, whatever is necessary to, for you to give me an office. But, but my starting position is I don't want to do anything. I just want a, an office space. And it turned out that the Los Gatos lab gave me an office space without making me do anything. And so I had an office by myself, to myself, basically working with the guys in New York, mm -hmm. but working out here. And so I don't, I don't know when the project finished, 
but it was 86 or 87 in that range. What year were you at Berkeley? 83, 84. And so we were mid-project. And so I was, again, I was doing all the logic design and microcode, but this time we had Dick Hadsell was writing software for us. And he, he interviewed with us for about a year before he decided, decided to join the project. It was the most rigorous reverse interview we've, I've ever seen. You know, he's like, I'm not sure if I want to join you guys. <laughs> and he, he literally, you know, he's writing simulators and doing stuff for us, and he's still not sure he wants to join the project. But after a year, he decides to join. And so, and then a guy named Bruce Gavril, he was, he also joined us. So you were in Los Gatos, you were working, you were working in the final stages of this v uh, micro 370. Micro 370, yeah. And that came to an end and you did what? Yeah, that was, well, so so the thing about we're being a research staff member at IBM is it, it's a wonderful position because you have a lot of autonomy. You can do pretty much what you want to do within some reason. and But they have a kind of a tenure process Namely, you, you're there for about a year and they decide whether or not you really belong there or not. And by that time, they had decided they were okay with me staying there. And so I was in a very comfortable position, but then I had, somebody started talking to me about a startup company and doing a 370 and, I mean, a, a x86 instruction set and a high performance implementation. and. I got kind of interested in that, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go do the startup thing. And I, and I struggled with that decision for a long time. And, and I have, again, I have some advice for young people here. Because in the course of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I thought, okay, I'm going to look at what I've done in the past and where I made mistakes and then I'm going to try to learn something from that about how to make the decision going forward. And I'm looking back and I'm going, uh, I really haven't made any mistakes so far. And I go, but I know that's not true. There's just no way. <laughs> I know I've made mistakes. <laughs> I've done really stupid things. But, but my personality is such that when I look back, I go, boy, I'm sure glad I did that. And so the upshot of that was that, that what I decided didn't matter because whatever I decided, by the time I got a little way down the path, my brain would reconfigure itself and say, boy, that, aren't you glad you did that? <laughs> and so so the, the net of all that is if you're happy with what you did in the past, you're going to be happy with what you do in the future. And so it took the, it Good took, way to look at it. it made the decision easy. So I went out and I said, okay, I'm going to go do this startup thing. And so I was one of the founders of this company called Next Gen Microsystems. Mm -hmm. We were doing a high end x86. Right. And we actually went and talked to Intel about that. And so they knew we were messing mm -hmm. with that. And they said, you know, we kind of wanted them to help us. And they're like, eh. You know, if we wanted to do it, we'd just do it. And it turned out it wasn't going to be a multi-chip implementation at the end of the project. That's just what we started with because we thought we could do it. And I was the director of product development, and so I hired all of the hardware engineering teams doing all the chip designs, and I managed those groups. I didn't last very long in that job, it turns out. And that was probably... That was not my favorite experience of my whole career. Because what happened there was the guy that was the CEO, and I'm not going to say who that was, although I guess it's discoverable. <laughs> Atik Raza? No, no, Atik is a wonderful guy. Okay. I, Atik, Atik actually saved the company. Atik is... So it was Atik's predecessor, okay. and, and, but he was, he was going around me to tell my guys what to do. Mm -hmm. And I'd go have these arguments with him, and I'd say, you can't do that, you know. If you just 
leave these guys alone. They will kill themselves for you. And he's like, no, no, if you turn your back on them, they're going to sit on their hands. And I'm like, you don't understand these guys. And, and you know, the interference that's happening here is, is going to cause them to leave, and you don't want them to leave. And he's like, we'll just hire another one. And I'm like, you don't understand. This guy's worked on this thing for a year. If he leaves, the guy that comes in is going to take like six months to understand what was happening here. And by the time he understands it, he's going to want to change it. You can't, you can't afford to lose these guys. And, and so I'm battling it out with this guy, but of course he's up here and I'm down here. And so finally I go, you know, we're losing engineers. This is going to fail. And so I go to a board member. I go to Marshall Cox, who's on the board of directors. He's the chairman of the board. Marshall, I like Marshall a lot. He's a, he's a flamboyant guy. Yeah. And, and I still... You know, he's, he's a Marine Corps general. You know, he was fighting in Korea at age 13. He was left on the battlefield for dead. I didn't get that part. They, they, a, anyway, he's a, he's a I very... I did the oral history with him down at his... Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, oh in Los Angeles? Yeah, in, the yeah. Cro in Rio de, no, Del Mar or... Yeah, Rio Del Mar or something. I, I don't my know. wife was a neighbor of his. From, I mean, it was just anyway. interesting cross. So I went to Marshall and I said, Marshall... This isn't working. My recommendation to you is fire all of the founders, including me, and bring some people in here who are competent to do this. Because I was also having problems with the software guy who was a founder. Mm -hmm. And there, there were five founders of, of that. And, and the software guy and I just didn't get along. I, I mean, I, I would... I would do my planning and I'd go to him and I'd say, I need this, 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 and this. And he'd go, mm, I'll give you 10% of that. I mean, I'm like, you don't understand. This isn't, this isn't that kind of negotiation. You know, it's not, we're not in a marketplace where you do barter. This is, if I don't get this, 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 and this, we can't do this. <laughs> you know, so he and I were just like this the whole time and and then of course the CEO and I were the same way because he's going around to my guys saying do this do that do this and it means just destroying morale so I go to Marshall and I go Marshall if you just get rid of all the founders then bring in some people I think this still has a good possibility of working and Marshall's like well I can't I can't do that I can't go around the CEO, but I'll bring it up with the board of directors and we'll try to resolve it. And so it turns out Vinod Koshla is on the board of directors. And so he calls me up and he says, come and see me. And so I go and see him and he's living in this hilltop. I go to his house and, and we're sitting there in this huge room and it's glass wall over here and, and I'm looking across the valley and I'm like man this is really a beautiful place you got here Vinod but it's a bummer that they're building a resort hotel right across the street from or you know across the valley from you and he goes oh n no that's my new house they're gonna tear this one down when I'm done with it you know <laughs> anyway so I, I'm talking to Vinod and I'm saying okay Vinod here's the story you're gonna get uh, you know, here's what I think the story looks like. And, and if you call these four guys, they'll tell you exactly what I've just told you. And if you want the other side of the story, call this guy, and he'll give you the other side of the story. And about three weeks later, Vinod calls me up, and he says, okay, I've done my due diligence. Uh, I called the four guys you told me to call. They told me exactly what you told me. I called the fifth guy. He told me exactly what you told me he was going to say. <laughs> he said, and, and I'm sitting there thinking, wow, you know, the, you know, my model of what's going on there is going to be confirmed, and we'll get this thing resolved. And, and Vinod says, so, you know, I think the right thing to do is get rid of you. <laughs> <laughs> so they got rid of me. <laughs> So, so I left NextGen, and, and which, by the way, 
and so Atik came in after that, sometime after I had been there. And, and in my opinion, he literally saved that project and that company. And, and I, I am truly grateful to him because when he said, what do we do with founders' shares? I think Atik said, you know, they deserve the shares that they had and go ahead and don't dilute them to zero. Mm -hmm. And and so, and, and he gave me a compliment too. He said, I came in and talked to your engineering team. He said, I've never seen such loyalty from guys. He said, <laughs> so he, but, but he, he made that project go through. He saved the company. He eventually became CEO and Marshall brokered the, you know, the company went public, NextGen went public, and then AMD came in and bought the company and I think right. that became the K6, K, yeah, whatever, K5, whatever. Yeah. one of those two. Yeah. And Atik became AMD's largest shareholder, I think, at that time. And, yeah, and, and so, CEO for a while. And yeah, yeah. But he's, I, I like Atik, I respect him. He's, he's a very smart guy. And I, yeah, in fact, he had actually worked for me at VLSI Technology before going oh, to do oh, that. So. Oh, okay. Well, he's very, very highly organized. I mean, yeah, he's just. He's very bright, very. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then another piece of the story, that cemented my relationship with, with uh, Marshall. Because he said, you know, CEO's telling me this, you're telling me this. You know, three years later, I find out everything you told me was just what you said it was. <laughs> and so I ended up actually investing with Marshall in some, uh, you know, he had a venture company for a yeah, while. And yeah. I found out a lot of, and in fact, he and I were, I was part of a, a what is it called? Pacific Fiber Optic something. I, anyway, I had got involved in a whole bunch of startup companies. And I invested alongside him in a bunch of ventures. And it turns out that, I am terrible at that investing stuff because the more I know about the technology, the, the more I th think I should be able to make good decisions about what's going to succeed. But it turns out that after being involved in, I, I think in the neighborhood of 50 startups as either a founder, an investor, an advisor, a board member, a, a peon, out of 50, the, I'd say the three or four that paid off other than next gen were ones that I knew nothing about. And the ones that I knew the most about were l probably the least likely to succeed. And actually I did a whole presentation on that. And it turns out these startups rarely fail for technical reasons. They usually fail because some self-destructive behavior among the mm -hmm. people that are involved in the thing. So you left NextGen, what year was that? Or what years were you at NextGen? Uh, 87 to 88, and some of this is gonna be not too accurate, but 87 to 88. So roughly 88, you left? Yeah, 88 uh, I left. They Now, do, I had a question. You had gone to some length to describe your own personal style and you wanna hide in an office in back of another office and just let me do the thing I need to do. And here you were managing a team in negotiating with the board and other things. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, that's not to say I can't do it. It's just, <laughs> I'm just no, it's not. Not your preferred mode of operation. Not my preferred, yeah. But, but I got a backhanded compliment from one of the board members at NextGen, and I've, I've temporarily forgotten his name. But, it, but he, but he saw, <laughs> saw me give a presentation, he said, that guy couldn't lie if he wanted to. <laughs> he couldn't. <laughs> so, anyways, so you left next gen. I left next gen and I started my own consulting company because a lot of the guys are like, hey, if you're leaving, I want to go wherever you're going. Mm -hmm. And so uh, enough of those guys came with me that I got a letter from next gen saying, stop stealing our people. Right. But I went off and did, a, did my own Tridentic Inc. Mm -hmm. doing... Uh, logic design and consulting, and, and we were doing consulting for uh, market research kind of stuff and patent litigation. Oh, and, yeah. and then I picked up, a, a can't tell you the company, but I was doing a design project, a microprocessor design project for that company in a clean room kind of operation. Mm -hmm. And I found out a couple of things about running your own company. One is if you're gonna do a logic design and consulting kind of business where you're 
kind of dependent on piecework. The right size for that company is one or greater than 25, but it isn't 10, which is what I had. So this was like having 10 mortgages. You know, these guys will work themselves to death for you, but they don't know or care where the business comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if you have a design contract, that's a good thing until the company decides to cancel the contract and then stiffs you on the receivables, which is exactly what happened to me. Mm. You know, and so I'm, I'm kind of struggling my way along with 10 mortgages and <laughs> it's not really, but I have these great guys working yeah. for me, you know, so, so I, I did that. In fact, I've still kind of got the company, but it's got no employees now because after doing that for a while and once this large company canceled its project and stiffed me on the invoices, I couldn't keep the guys, you know, they had to go. And, and it was, that was this guy, John Pavan, he's, he has trouble working with anybody, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's a very smart guy and he liked working for me. <laughs> and, I, and I have to give the guys the bad news. <laughs> and he comes in and he says, well, <laughs> I talked it over with my wife. <laughs> And I can work for you for a year and a half without pay. <laughs> John, I can't do that. <laughs> so, so about that time, uh, Bob Hartman came to see me. And Bob Hartman yeah. was one of the founders at Altera, yeah. employee number one at Alt Altera. Yeah. And he says, why don't you come over and, and uh, why don't you work for us? You know, I'll... I'll I'd like to hire you. He originally interviewed me a few years before that to be VP of engineering, but I, I couldn't do that because I was, um, I had all these employees, and so I just couldn't. Mm -hmm. I couldn't afford to go to work for Altera then, but he came back again and said, come to work for me. And so I went to work for Bob, and we were doing, he was, I think at that time, he, he had been VP of engineering, and he was trying to replace himself the first time he talked to me, and that probably would have been a mistake. I don't, I don't know, but, but he found somebody else to do that. And then the second time he came back, he was, um, he was VP of business development at that time. And so he and I were working on business development and I worked for him and I was, we were struggling to find a title for me at that time because I didn't have any employees, so he couldn't make me a director, but I was reporting directly to a VP, and so what do we do? And mm -hmm. so I said, well, I'd, I'd like to be chief scientist. And he's like, okay, you're chief scientist. So I was chief scientist at Altera for a couple of years. And, and it was wonderful working with Bob because we, we got along well. And, and I don't know what he was doing besides talking to me, but he left me to do my own, my own organization of what was going on. And so my objective was, I, I would like to support the companies that are gonna be our biggest customers 10 years from now, or five years from now. And so I started this, I started working with universities and I started working with startup companies. I had a one page contract for startup companies that said, uh, you know, we'll supply you with software, maybe give you parts. And in exchange for that, the next time you do a funding round, give us the opportunity to participate. And that's all it was. It was a pretty simple contract. And so I was working with like 300 people at that time. And, and eventually we designed a circuit board that fit in a PC that had a bunch of our chips on it that you could do. I got into this topic called reconfigurable computing. Right. And so we, I contracted with a guy named uh, Dave Vandenbout, who was a professor at, I don't know, North Carolina State or something. And together we designed a board that took a bunch of these chips and actually filed a couple of patents on that. So what was the goal? What was the strategy in the reconfigurable, reconfigurable computing? Um, what was the target applications that you were looking at? Well, any, anything that for which custom logic was faster than a, CPU and, and that was a lot of stuff. You know, the, the problem with programmable chips at that time was that they weren't partially reconfigurable. You had to do the whole chip. Mm -hmm. 
but there were things where you could you could download an algorithm and run it in parallel instead of having to go through a loop. You know, you could build a data flow structure. And, you know, so it looked to me like reconfigurable com computing would have a nice future in computing if we could. And there were startup companies that that wanted to do that kind of thing. And so I, I was building an organization to building an organization. It was one guy, but I was building a, a database of people that were doing that, and I was hoping that something would come of that. But in the meantime, I was teasing Bob, because I'm like, Bob, because we'd think up these things, and we'd go to Rodney, who was CEO of, of Altera at the time. He turned us down for everything. Every proposal we took to him, he said no. I'm like, Bob, this is frustrating. You're a multi-zillionaire, you know? I mean, as employee number one at Altera, you got, you're a multi-zillionaire. Why are you doing this? Well, it turned out that the reason that they were doing that was that at that time, and this is going to turn into irony if you know the current history, because at the time, Altera was like a $50 million company. It wasn't you know, it wasn't multi-billion dollar company. It was a little company at this time. This is 93. It's this 10-year anniversary. And by the way, Altera is one year older than Xilinx. <laughs> Xilinx wins the PR stuff, but Altera's... And, and there's an interesting comparison between Xilinx and Altera, but maybe we won't get into that. But anyway, back to this thing. So Rodney was turning us down on everything because he was negotiating at that time with Intel to buy Intel's FPGA business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they closed that deal for like $50 million, and then what is it, 25 years later or so, Intel buys <laughs> Altera, <it> <laughs> buys it back. <laughs> but he was turning us down for everything. And so after about a year of this, I come into Bob's office and he says, you know, I've been thinking about this thing you've been teasing me about, I'm retiring. I'm like, no, Bob, don't, please don't retire. <laughs> Please, because I like working for you. This is a fun job. I, you know, it's great. And he's like, nope, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm going. So, so he retires, and they give me to a guy named Don Feria. Well, Don, I think at that time is managing all the software for the Altera products. And I get along really well with Don. Don's a great guy. He's smart. He's he, he's just a prince of a guy. I like Don. And Don kind of likes me. He says, you know, you're, you're the break in my week. You know, I struggle with all this politics and software and stuff, deadlines all week long, and one day a week you come in and talk about all this wonderful stuff and all the fun. You know, it's great. But, but I worked for Don for about a year, and, and I come back from the Christmas holidays, and he's not in his office. I'm like, where's Don? Well, Don went, he left, he left. I'm like, oh, great, you know. So then they give me to the marketing guy. Well, I sit down with the marketing guy and I start telling him what I'm doing and it's like I'm speaking Greek. He's like, no, no, I... No, I had one conversation with him, and all of a sudden I'm assigned to the VP of Engineering. So I go see the VP of Engineering, and, and, and that was not good. That was not, this was mixing oil and water. We just did not get along. And it was, I lasted about six more months with him, and I finally went into his office, and I said, you know, it's time for review. And I don't know whether you're going to give me a raise or fire me. I mean, I just don't know. And, and he looks at me, and I think he said something that was equivalent to that. I don't know either. You know, what are you doing? You know, the press is always calling you. People are always calling you. Know, you're ne you're, you know, you're working with all these people outside. Why don't you take one of your boards, plug it into a system, and do some experiments? And I'm like, you want me to go take one board and run an experiment. I've got, I mean, how much leverage do I have with 300 people out there? There's no leverage in doing this. And so I'm like, mm, I don't think I want to do that. 
So then I decide I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit. So I, I left. I think I was only there two and a half years or something like that. Not, but I, I liked the job. I liked working for Bob. I liked working for uh, Don. It was, it was great. I, I, so what year did you join Altera? Where? What year? What year? 93. And you left in 95. 95. Yeah, sometime in 95. Okay, so we were uh, in, we were at uh, leaving Altera in 1995, uh, but you said that you had uh, you had some other jobs you'd left out. So why don't we briefly well, uh, they're cover just, those? Yeah, okay, it's, it's just uh, a little thing. I, I you know, <laughs> I, t I said I was in this reserve unit that was in flying out of Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio. Eventually I changed to a unit that, they put a unit at Bergstrom Air Force Base right there in Austin. And so I joined that unit. I was also the plans officer for that unit. But I was still teaching at the University of Texas, both in electrical engineering and in the computer science department. So while I was working at Motorola. Anyway, that was a piece I had just left out. So when I, when I went to New York for uh, and another piece of the story I just forgot and uh, or forgot to mention, when I moved to New York to work for IBM, I interviewed with C-130 units that were in the Northeast area, and I chose one, oddly enough, in Schenectady, New York. Oh, <laughs> your hometown, huh? My hometown, because it turns out, so I'm looking at these C-130 units and I go, I mean, I've already flown this kind of mission, but these guys in Schenectady have ski model C-130s. Oh. They have wheels and skis, and they do Arctic resupply. You know, I don't know if you know what the dew line sites are, but they're radar yeah, sites yeah. that were above the Arctic Circle that yeah. tried to yeah, watch for Soviet, watch for Soviet yeah. missile launches. Yeah. Well, we did Arctic resupply for those sites mm. with, with that airplane. It was all done with reservists. Well, that's actually New York Air National Guard. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, I was in the Air Force on active duty and then in the Air Force Reserve when I was in Texas. When I moved to New York, that unit was an Air National Guard unit, which is different from the reserves for some reason. So now I've been in the Air Force, the Air Force Reserve, and the Air National Guard. And, and, but it was great flying with those guys. Because the thing that's different between the service and the guard people is that the guard people are there forever. You know, they've been in that same airplane and th some of their sons and daughters are flying those airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's a, it's a great unit. It was fun. We, we did Arctic resupply and flying out to the dew line sites on the ice cap in Greenland. We flew up to Sandestrom Air Force Base and and then flew 250 miles out to a radar site. And so, I mean, it's like flying inside a ping pong ball. Yeah, it's white everywhere. Because the whole horizon is white, the sky's white, everything is white. And you see a speck in the far horizon, and, and it's 90 miles away, that's the dew line site you're headed for. And this is a big building, it's a six story building sitting on stilts and the reason they sit on stilts is that they're on 10,000 feet of ice and so they have and but they're running a radar 24 hours a day that has to be absolutely level and so they have stilts and because of regulation the stilts are sinking and so they they put in another section and jack it up to keep it level and pretty soon the the legs get too tall and so they have to, during the time I was in the unit, they had to move one of the radar sites. Mm -hmm. And this is a big building, it's a six story huge, probably bigger than this building, and they're going to need to move it. So what are they going to do? Okay, well, basically what you do is you build a set of railroad tracks, you put wheels on the legs, and you, you cut off the old legs and you push it over to the new site and you start over again. And so I was involved in some of that while they were doing it, and the, and the radar site had to stay operational while they were doing that. Anyway, that's another part of the story, but I ended up flying ski model C-130s, which was its own interesting experience. And that was, again, that was at IBM. When I, when I moved out to California, then I had to, I had to find another unit, and this is where my luck kind of ran out. Because I was 83, I moved out to California and I 
stayed with the unit in New York until 84. It was the last time I flew the C-130. When I came out to California, I said, you know, I'd really kind of like to fly helicopters. And so I started looking around at helicopter units, and I go, you know, I'll, whatever it takes, I'll go to helicopter school. I don't care. Send me to helicopter school. And it turned out there was a C-130 rescue unit out here at Moffett Field that had both C-130s and helicopters. And the smart thing to do would have been to go, hey, I want to fly C-130 rescue cop, uh, rescue C-130s and get in the unit and then tell them I want to fly helicopters. But I said, no, I want to fly helicopters. And they said, no, nah, we can't do that. So I talked to a Navy unit and they said, yeah, we'll send you to helicopter school, sure. But you're an Air Force guy, you need to be a Navy guy. <laughs> you're gonna have to do an inter-service transfer. And I go, okay, I'll do an inter-service transfer. What can it take? You know, it's a little paperwork, no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. It took like one year to do the paperwork to get transferred from the Air Force to the Navy. But I finally get it done. And I go back to the helicopter unit and I go, hey, I'm in yeah. the Navy. And they go, you know, during that year that you were gone trying to do this paperwork, darned if the Marine Corps didn't throw out a thousand helicopter pilots and we filled up the unit. We can't let you in. I think, okay, bummer. Um, so I start looking at Navy units that are flying something and I fly a, find a DC-9 unit that says, oh, sure, we'll, we'll take you in a DC-9 unit. But then they go, um, your designator, there's a problem with that. If you were on active duty, this would be a flying designator, but the designator that they gave you is aerospace engineering duty officer in the reserve programs, that's not a flying slot. So you're gonna have to get your designator changed. All right, I'm a year into this process. I go, okay, no problem. I'll just go get my designator changed so I can fly these DC-9s here. Meanwhile, I'm the maintenance officer on the DC-9s. So, okay, um, I start down that path. And they go, no, no, no. We have plenty of pilots in the Navy. We don't have very many PhDs in the Navy. You're a PhD in electrical engineering, we need those guys. <laughs> You're gonna be Naval Air Systems Command Aerospace Engineering Duty Officer, and that's what you're going to do. And then, and then they happen you to know. You were there all, all by your own choice. I mean, you didn't have to be in the reserves. At this oh point, no, no, right? I could have. Yeah, that's you right. Just that's bailed. right. That's right. But it turned out another one of those things. So I go, okay, I'll, I'll join one of these aerospace engineering design units, you know, and I, I ended up. It turned out there's six people in the unit, two lieutenant commanders, two commanders, and two captains, or some number like that. Well, that's, I don't know if you know, the, the rank structure in the, any of the services is pretty steep. You know, making 06, which is lieutenant, I mean, colonel or, or uh, captain in the Navy, it's difficult. Make an admiral or general is even tougher, but anyway, so I ended up I ended up in an aerospace engineering unit. Going back to the Pentagon to do, uh, working for the C-4 ISR czar. C-4 ISR is command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance. And so he's in charge of all that stuff, and he's like a two or three star admiral, and I'm working for his chief scientist. And I go in to talk to his chief scientist, and we just sit down, and he says, well, I got this and this and this and this and this project. And I go, well, that one sounds pretty interesting. And so I take one of his projects, and it's these are things called UFERS, unfunded requirements. It's things that you have to have, but there's no money for it. And so they have a bunch of those in the services. And the Navy's got to try to figure out, well, we're going to have to rank these things to figure out which one, if we ever get any money, where do we put it first? <laughs> you know, so... I'm looking at these, and, I, and one of them's on conformal antennas or something, and one of them's on 
what kind of computers are we going to do? And, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I kind of like it. I, I talked to the guy for a while. I go, I'll take that project, and I'll go, I'll come back in two or three weeks and tell you, I, I'll write a two-page memo that a two- or three-star admiral that majored in political science can understand, you know, what is, what's the story on conformal antennas? And I kind of liked doing that. And so I ended up in that reserve unit and commanding it eventually and making captain Navy. And I eventually retired with 30 years in the Navy. And so that, that's part of the story. And I, I was also on the Army Science Board, which uh, happened in 94. So that was while I was at Altera. And, and another piece of the story is I also do volunteer work for the IEEE in accreditation. So I'm looking at computer and electrical engineering programs at universities to see whether or not they should be accredited. Mm -hmm. And I started that in 83, 1983, and I've, I'm still doing it. So in the interim, it used to be just the United States. Now it's gone international. And for the last 10 or 15 years, I just visit international programs. I've been to Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, wow. Egypt. Indonesia, I go to all these countries and look at the engineering programs in those countries, and, and by and large, they're very rigorous technically. They're good programs. Mm -hmm. A lot of the universities are, uh, it's a competitive hierarchy to even get in. And I mean, there's just, it's impressive. I mean, you go to a place in Saudi Arabia, and here's a guy who grew up in Pakistan teaching in Saudi Arabia who's got his PhD from some place in Japan. I mean, and he's speaking to me in English. And of course, the textbooks are mostly in English. And yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, you want to be humbled, <laughs> go anywhere and talk to some of those people. Right. You know, so anyway, I forgot where I left off the well, story. Well, we're still back in 95 and uh, left Altera. So. Yeah, so, so then I went into what I'd call my blank years. I don't know, I was basically consulting at that time. So I'm involved in patent cases, which is its own horrible experience if you haven't done that, you know, where you're an so expert, you were a technical expert, expert the, witness. The expert uh, witness. Yeah, I was a special master at one time, which I think is a better thing. You know, this is one where both sides agree that you're an expert that's objective and you're hired basically. They, they split the cost of paying you, but you work for the judge. Mm -hmm. And, and that was probably, of all of the litigation experience I've had, that was the best and probably the least common. <laughs> probably those are related. This is, this is a good paying job too, but, right? You know, yes, yes. I, so, so when I first got in the service, I think I was getting paid $435 a month. Mm -hmm. I make more than that per hour consulting on patents. Right. And that's partly because it's sporadic and partly because it's um, specialized. It's rare. difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you, I mean, testifying in front of a jury is difficult. Sitting through a deposition where the guys are absolutely trying to trick you and, mm -hmm. and destroy your credibility is a, I, I won't say it's a skill, but, it, but it's definitely stressful. <laughs> just you know because they're in there with a video recorder they've got another expert or two sitting across from you who's whispering to the attorney they got a, three or four attorneys you know they're taking every word you say and um, it, it's so I did that for a number of years and and I'm still uh, other things I've forgotten to mention along the way starting in about 1988 that was the first microprocessor forum. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the microprocessor and report yeah, so and that's, your work with that. Yeah, so that's Michael Slater's, mm -hmm. uh, he started that whole business, the microprocessor report and the microprocessor forum. And I spoke at the very first microprocessor forum. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of my talk, people are laughing throughout the whole presentation, you know. And so after that, Michael comes up to me and he says, you know, I want you to come back next year and drop the technical pretense and just do comedy for us. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So I ended up doing this thing called the Microprocessor Report Awards. And I did that for 16 or 17 years, every year. And I think it was the highest rated session in the conference every year. And I, and I also, Michael eventually invited me to be on These the awards that you made up in terms of- Yeah, uh, stuff, I, I collect stuff all year long. Right. And, and then I just, I mean, it's pure satire and it's pure roasting, them. <laughs> roasting people in the industry, you know. And I, I did one, for example, on the inventor of the microprocessor. And I said, you know how we used to argue about who's the world's best quarterback and who's the best, you know, we used to be big fights about who's, you know, is Johnny Unitas better than uh, Sammy Baugh and that kind of, back in the old days. But that all died. And when, when did that die? That died with the NFL quarterback rating system. So why don't we have a, a who invented the microprocessor rating system? And so I invented a bunch of parameters and things like, uh, and this was, I shouldn't name names, but somebody's wife is his best advocate. You know, how, <laughs> how influential is his wife? You know, how many patents does he have? You know, what? did he do here and here and here. So I had all these parameters and I this big phony equation and I, I present the results of that big phony equation and some of the guys are sitting in the audience out there listening to this presentation and in fact after the presentation and, and so I show, you know, it looks like a horse race over the years with positions changing as things go along and, and I don't name names at the end of it <laughs> but at the end of the presentation one of them comes up to me and he says, so did I turn out to be the inventor of the microprocessor? <laughs> what? You don't understand. This is Santa. <laughs> so, so I actually wrote a paper about that called Football and Microprocessors. Mm -hmm. and, and earlier I mentioned uh, visiting Vinod about this whole thing on, with NextGen. Yeah. I wrote a paper about that too, and it's called an engineer's view of venture capitalists. <laughs> and so, so Michael invited me to be on the editorial board for Microprocessor Report in, I don't remember what year that was, but it was probably early 90s, after I'd given a few presentations and had been on, uh, been giving the, doing the award ceremony for a few years got on the editorial board, and of course I'm writing for Microprocessor Report at the same time, so I'm writing all these pieces about risk and workstations and the, you know all this stuff, and I, I think over the course of my career I've written, I don't know, 60 or 70 papers. The first of which, well, the first one that, that was very popular was one that I wrote at IBM called on systematic generation of scientific papers, which told you how to take a no content topic and turn it into something that any publication would accept. And so it went through, and it was satire again. It was just how to turn plain language into gobbledygook that, that looked pretty good. Oh, and I forgot, I mean, this is, maybe sounds incoherent, but it's important, I think. I for, you, you mentioned publishing a book. And for that, for that paper that on scientific papers, mm -hmm. we got requests from all over the place. This was back before the internet. And we got, I got requests from Russia for copies of that paper. <laughs> and people wanting to know, at the end of it, we, we talked about how we were gonna automate the process. I was and about they to wanted, say today you could just automate it, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and so our last paragraphs are talking about automating that process. And so we had people inquiring about, you know, how soon is that gonna be ready? And anyway, so, Back to the book, which was another thing that I forgot to mention, which was that, you know, we're writing this book about a design that's been done inside IBM and the design process and all that, and, and we know we're gonna have to negotiate with IBM's management about getting this book released. So we go, okay, well, how are we gonna do that? Well, so let's write a red herring chapter. So we wrote an entire chapter on m management struggles. And, and actually, I mean, it, was, it should have been in the book, but we knew it wasn't going to be. <laughs> but, 
but, but we put it in the book and we turn the book in for publication release and they don't say anything about the technical content. They want to negotiate that chapter and leave that chapter out, you can publish the thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you gave them something to focus on and say, okay, <laughs> sure, okay, we'll throw that out. <laughs> yeah. Great yeah. strategy. So what, um, I'm not sure where, you said for several years you were doing yeah, so consulting and that sort of thing. Yeah, so from and like 95 when I left Altera, I was mm -hmm. doing consulting. I was working with some startup companies, you know, board of directors or investor yeah. advisor, that kind of thing, and, and writing for Microprocessor Report a little bit. And, of course, I'm still in the Naval Reserve and, mm -hmm. and taking voluntary duty there. But also about that time, which is like 1994, I get invited to be on the Army Science Board. And that's a federal advisory committee that reports to the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff. And so it's a high, it's a nice assignment. They, you go study problems at the Army thing. Well, they do two kinds of things. They have internally generated studies. In other words, if you think that micro air vehicles are gonna be a big thing that's important to the Army, but no general has requested a study on that, you can initiate a study on that and say, hey Army, this is coming along, this might be really important, you ought to look at it. The other way those studies came down was some general or admiral would have some problem. Well, since I was on the Army Science Board, it was a uh, general. Say, hey, we wanna know about, you know, as our is our comm system doing the right thing? And I ended up leading a study on whether or not the plans for the next generation field comm systems were good. And, and that, I mean, it turns out that's a whole political mess. I ended up spending like 12 years doing, you can do, do five year tours, which turn out to be, they can be six years and then you're off for a little while and you can come back. And so I did that. And just at the time my clearance ran out, they say, come back. And so I had to go through another clearance process. And these are top secret SCI kind of things, you know, where you got special clearances for some of these projects, but it's very interesting. I mean, you can go anywhere and study. I mean, I went and I led a study on robotics, for example. I just go visit all the guys at MIT and iRobot and Red, Red. what's the one in, Carne at Car go talk to Carnegie Mellon guys. And you can talk to all the robotics guys, you know, just travel all over the place, talk to all those guys, and then you go summarize it for them and tell them, here's what's going on in robotics and what you ought to be thinking about. And, it was very gratifying. I did. I participated in 17 studies over a period of about 12 years. 17. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. And a, a lot of. You've been busy in your semi-retirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and it's all, of course, it's all unpaid. But, but still, I mean, you're all the work for the army is all unpaid. Oh yeah, they pay all your travel expenses, yeah, but. but and I thought, hey, I'm working for you guys. Could I at least get retirement points? You know, just give me credit for showing up. No, no, nothing. So you get nothing for that. But, but hey, you're meeting all these one, two, three, four-star generals, and, and the, you're coming in at the captains of industry, and you go watch the demos of the A1 tanks firing depleted uranium rounds. And, you know, those, it's interesting because... Yeah. because I watched a mock tank battle, and the the rounds that they're firing are more like arrows than bullets, because they have fins on them and they got packing around them, and the barrel's smooth, and the thing's depleted uranium, and and it's I don't know how long they are, but you're getting a lot of kinetic energy that's going to be dissipated in a very small point, and it, I mean it just destroys the thing. You watch the trajectories because you can see them because they're ionizing the air mm -hmm. all the way from the source to the destination and it's just a straight line. I mean it's not like they're arcing over and you need any table for that kind of thing and that's when they went to Iraq and started shooting those guys they were hauled down behind the sand dunes. They just shot through the sand dune. Who cares? I mean it's just a straight line. <laughs> Take out the tanks. <laughs> So anyway, I worked, I worked a number of studies for the Army Science Board and I, I met a lot of really interesting people there and got to do a lot of interesting studies. 
But eventually, and, I, and as I say, I was still writing for Microprocessor Report. I was also on the editorial board of IEEE Spectrum, mm -hmm. which was kind of... You're doing a lot of writing. Yeah, yeah, well, I did, yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, anyway, I... Microprocessor Report, I, well, IEEE, you were just on the boards. Yeah, you? I was on the board. But all the studies that you were doing for the Army? Yeah, yeah, I was writing those studies, and I, I was also on a bunch of other editorial boards, microprocessors and microsystems, embedded systems, some other, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but eventually I got a call from a guy named George Gilder. This is in about 2000, so I go through the dark years there, and about 2000 I get a call from George Gilder, and I'm like, I know this guy. And he says, could you come and talk to us? We do this thing called Gilder Technology Report, and the middle two pages are uh, microprocessor, you know, what's going on in microprocessors. And he said, I've, I've read a lot of your stuff and I, I kind of like the way you write. Come and talk to me about writing, taking over the writing the middle page of that thing. And so I went to, I don't know where he is, Framingham, Massachusetts or something. He's, he's in uh, the Berkshires somewhere. And I went to talk to him in his offices. And at that time, I think he had 65,000 subscribers or something. I mean, he was, he was doing very well. And he had this conference called Telecosm. I, I don't know if you know who George Gilder is at all. Yeah, I know the name. I know a little okay, bit. Okay, so he, he wrote Wealth and Poverty. Okay. And he was the most quoted living author um, by Ronald Reagan. And then he wrote Life After Television, Spirit of Enterprise, Men and Marriage, uh, and he just has a current book out called Life After Google, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. Anyway, so he, in about 2000, he gives me a call and says, come and, come and interview with me. And, and so I go to his office and start talking to him about this stuff. And, I, and he says, I want you to write the middle pages of my newsletter for me. And it's a microprocessor summary. And, I, and I'm sitting there going, you know, George, I just don't think that's really what you want for the middle page of your <laughs> newsletter. I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in microelectromechanical systems and quantum dots and nanotubes and microfluidics. And, and I think you ought to broaden it and cover all these other topics because there's just a lot going on. And I mean, you're a technology newsletter. And at the time he was kind of focused in communications. He was like the first guy to say, hey, I think CDMA and Qualcomm are really good, mm -hmm. a good thing to do, and a lot of people got very rich investing in Qualcomm mm -hmm. based on that. And so his newsletter was very popular, but it was pretty much focused on silicon. I mean, Carver Mead was one of his pals. He hung out a lot with Carver. Anyway, so, so he says, yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. Why don't you do that? And I'm like, well, I, I don't know anything about any of those topics. <laughs> <laughs> I just think they're really interesting. And, and so he's like, well, but, you know, our audience knows absolutely nothing about those things. The people that, that our subscribers are the guy that invented duct tape as one of his subscribers. The guy made... $10 million selling lawn furniture is one of his subscribers. And so what he really has is non-technical technology enthusiasts. So he says, all you have to do is go find a topic, learn enough about it to see what's important, and then just write that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, so I took a job with George and, and eventually I had my own newsletter called Dynamic Silicon, which covered all that stuff, microfluidics and MEMS. And it was a fun newsletter to write. George is really smart and he's a nice guy and he's great to work for. And I, I really enjoyed that. Unfortunately, 2000 was about the peak of the telecom business. And then there was that telecom crash. Mm -hmm. And so all that's, and he had this conference called Telecosm, and that ran, and I had my own Dynamic Silicon Conference, and I wrote the newsletter for a couple of years, but the business started to go bad. Now, you distributed it through his... It, mean, it was, yeah, it was Gilder Publishing, and they published uh, 
the Gilder Technology Report, Dynamic Silicon, the Biotech Newsletter, and the Power Cosm. So there were like four newsletters, and mine was one of them. And as the telecom business went down, those newsletters gradually collapsed back into the Gilder Technology Report. And so I ended up, he and I wrote Gilder Technology Report for a few years and, because he was writing another book. He's written like 20 books. Yeah, yeah. And when he was busy writing, excuse me, writing a book or off giving lectures or something, and then I'd write the newsletter. So you can go back and read those newsletters, and we have very different styles of writing, and so you can kind of tell which ones I wrote. But it, I don't, I don't know if anybody else knew that there were actually two writers. Two authors. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I mean, I was listed on there, and I'm still, I, in fact, my business card still says I'm with Gilder Publishing. So as far as the world is concerned, I'm, I still have Tridentic Incorporated. I still work for Gilder Publishing. I'm now retired from the military, and my wife hopes I don't run into a Marine Corps recruiter because I've <laughs> got the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force all behind me now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I don't know what I, I want to go back to the general topic of uh, reconfigur reconfigurable computing. So, have you played around with that for a while? You know what what's happened? What did, what did you feel the outcome of that was? What what made that work or didn't work? What's the status of that? Well, actually, the whole community is still. I wouldn't say thriving, but it's growing, and it's still a pretty decent topic, I'd say. It's, you know, I basically, once I left Altera, I didn't have any resources to participate in any of that. I mean, I didn't really, I guess I could have applied at universities for a position, but I just... Not what you want to do. Yeah, and so I kind of left the topic behind, but... But there's still, I mean, you know, what, what happened was there was, a, there was a research community that was pushing for features in the FPGAs, and the FPGA companies just weren't listening to the research, the university guys, because they were, they had growing markets commercially that were as good as they as much as they could supply. They were growing as fast as they could manage. And so they didn't really need to listen to the university guys, but eventually that happened. And so now you have features like partial reconfiguration inside the, the processor, and it's fundamental to the processor. You, you know, if one of them had done it and the other one didn't, they, the other one would be out of, the one that didn't would be out of business. So, so eventually the university guys became more influential as the, application base and so let me go back to what I think the problem is with with FPGAs mm -hmm. and that's that when the company started they were they were all transistor guys you know they're layout guys right. they're making FPGAs right. after they got to a certain size saying I'll say it's a million components a chip they go you know these are really logic designs and not circuit designs we better start hiring some logic designers, but, but the chips themselves still required logic designers in order to make use of their capabilities, and the community of logic designers wasn't growing very fast, and so I think those FPGA companies would have done better and therefore reconfigure computing would have done a lot better if the companies, and I'm talking inside the companies, if Felterra and Xilinx had started you know, they started, once they passed a million transistors, they started hiring guys from LSI Logic, John Dana and those guys. The Logic guys came in and started running those companies. If they had said, wait a minute, there are 10 times or 100 times as many programmers as there are Logic designers, maybe we should have software guys running the company and maybe we ought to make these chips accessible to programmers instead of Logic designers. Then they could have made that transition to mm -hmm continue the growth rate. And I think that's really what's kind of stalled both reconfigurable computing and the FPGA business was that they didn't make that, they maxed out on the number of design seats that they could sell because there just aren't enough logic designers in the communities to support the kind of growth that they could have had. 
So that's that, I guess that covers yeah. kind of reconfigurable computing as well. But there's definitely still a community out there that does that, and the, the chips are now headed in that way. They're they're enabling partial con reconfiguration, mm -hmm. runtime reconfiguration. So. Okay, so let's uh, wrap things up. Uh, what you you were working with George Gilder, Yoder Publishing. Uh, what sort of what comes after that? Or have you well, actually, for the are past we, are we up to speed or what? Uh, we're almost there. We're almost there. For the past five years, I've been working with a startup company. Is again <laughs> one of. Well, it was three guys, now it's two guys. <laughs> but for the past five years, and we're working on transaction security and format preserving encryption, so cryptographic stuff and, and chip level identity and, and uh, key management. So, the, so it turns out, I'll try to make the story kind of brief, but <laughs> we started out saying, you know, if we did this, cryptographic protocol where we have end-to-end -end encryption, then we don't care what the holes in the internet are and the protocols that are traveling over the internet. As long as we have end-to-end -end encryption, we can get, we can avoid man-in-the-middle attacks and, mm -hmm. and replay attacks and things like that. And then we go, well, yeah, but the endpoints aren't secure. So then we started messing with write-only storage and some kind of storage that would be secure and that kind of thing. And ultimately we go, we know really you need chip level identity. You need to, each chip has to be able to create its own cryptographic keys and it needs to have three of them. It needs to have a secret key, a private key, and a public key. And the public key is gonna be its identity. And you can't store it on chip either. So you have to be able to, when you power up, you have to be able to retrieve the original key every time over the life of the process. And that's an unsolved problem right now. And so we've been working on that for like five years and we have the solution to it. We can do what we call precise key recovery and we can do self-provisioning. In other words, when you manufacture the chip, you don't have to do it in a secure facility. It's gonna, first time you power it up, it's going to create its own keys that it can recover even as the process degrades over 20 years. It'll still be able to give you that original key back. And so, so we've been doing that now for, well, it has to be self-provisioning and it has to be uh, autonomously manage those keys. And you have to have a way to communicate securely. And so once you've solved all those problems, you can do transaction security the problem is, how do you get it into the field? Because if I go to Microsoft, they go, well, your protocol looks interesting, but we don't care about the chips. And if you go to the chip manufacturers, they go, what do we want with that? You know, you can't deploy this protocol. So, so we're currently working on a strategy to do that. And I'm also an advisor to Silicon Catalyst, which is a very interesting company that's run by um, Pete Rodriguez, who used to be in my Navy Reserve unit. <laughs> so <laughs> he's the CEO of Silicon Catalyst. And if you're not familiar with Silicon Catalyst, that is a good place for you to mine for the people you may not have interviewed yet because you go on their table of it. Go look at Silicon Catalyst's website and then go to the advisors page mm -hmm. and just get a list of the advisors. And they're, I mean, they're John East and guys that are, they're the, they're the, guys that have been in Silicon Valley for decades. And so what, what does Silicon Catalyst do? What's, uh... it, it looks at candidate startup companies that are specifically trying to build hardware because he, their idea was, and I think this was uh, uh, Rick, I've forgotten his last name at the moment. Rick Lasansky, I think is his name, started this. And he said, you know, the, all anybody wants to do anymore is software. Yeah, yeah. So we need chip companies, and this is Silicon Valley. So right. let's build a support structure for chip companies. And so, so they, is it a venture firm? It's a venture. It's kind of a venture firm, but they've got a whole bunch of partners like Siemens and Bosch and TSMC so they, and Advantest. Right. And the little the, ecosystem to support. The, the, yeah, they've got like 18 of these contributing partners 
that'll supply you with the design tools and the test patterns and the shuttle runs. And so they look at candidate companies and they call their advisors in and we sit out in the audience and kibitz the startup companies mm -hmm. and decide, hey, you know, that's a good idea, but you know, that's not gonna work for this reason and this reason. And we try to adjust them. And I think over the past few years, they've looked at almost 300 companies and they've selected 18 of them, I wanna say, some number like that. So it's a pretty steep yeah. selection process but they've got some very interesting companies and they can provide them with uh, you know, chip support and design tool support, millions of dollars of support to a startup company, including shuttle runs and, and potentially customers. Texas Instruments, yeah, yeah. for example, is one of the sponsors. And so it's, a, it's very interesting. And it's, I mean, it's, for me, it's just, it's like, I don't belong here, but if I can get in a room with all these smart people, I can listen to them and talk to them. And they really, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing collection of people that they've put together. But I have to say, I think I have the most interesting bio on the advisors list. <laughs> I think that's a safe, uh, safe assumption based on others that I've spoken with. <laughs> Nobody has quite the varied combination of uh, <laughs> skills and background that you bring to the table. <laughs> yeah, I'm still I'm still searching for that. You know, there's this movie called The Natural. Yeah. Which is about a baseball, baseball guy. Baseball, yeah. Right? Right. So I'm still searching for that thing that I'm a natural at and I just haven't <laughs> found it yet. <laughs> but I, I remember I walked in, I was doing a consulting job for some Japanese company one time and I and I walked into the company and the guy looks at me and he goes Aren't you Nick Trudenick? Yeah, well, I thought you were a professional comedian. <laughs> <laughs> you were here to consult. Because <laughs> he had been to Microprocessor Report, or the, the, the forum. The forum, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I aspire to be Don McMillan someday. <laughs> Do you know Don personally? You must no, no, but I, I do like his presentations. I mean, I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't talked to him for quite a while, but I mean, we've exchanged a couple of emails. But. Oh, yeah, I mean, his story's about, about <laughs> Al Stein and forgetting his badge. I mean, Don forgot his badge, and he's, he's got Mohammed somebody or other's <laughs> badge on. And, and because Al's a stickler for badges. Yeah, everybody's got to like, have their badge. You yeah, got it. Yeah. What are you doing today, Mohammed? So, so as a, as a wrap-up, Jesse Jenkins asked me to ask you about your home in Santa Cruz Mountains. Oh, oh. well, so my wife is a city girl, but now she's a country hermit. So we have 37 acres out in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and I do what I call recreational landscaping. I have miles of roads to maintain, and I have a, I have a number of tractors and a bunch of military vehicles. And my wife, my wife is, she's a gym, but she says, you know, it's a good thing you weren't born a girl because you can't say no. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have something like 14 cars, and and I've got I've got a five-ton military wrecker, you know, a tank retriever. I've got a five-ton military dump truck, which which causes problems with an insurance company because you go, um, no, I'm not. You know, they want to charge commercial rates for a dump truck, and I'm I'm saying no, this is just a personal dump truck. I'm not running a business out of this. You know, it's not what I have it for. And they're like, we don't believe you. So anyway, I have a military. Say, come visit me and then you'll. <laughs> yeah, come visit me and then you'll believe me. So I, I have a, a military dump truck. It's actually my second one. I, I rolled my first military dump truck. I was helping a neighbor. I was going to help him backfill his retaining wall. And I was backing down his driveway when the brakes failed. One of the brake lines broke. I mean, these are old vehicles, this mm -hmm. 1970. I rolled backwards down his driveway, took out his carport, went between the house and the retaining wall. I, I'm sorry, the house and the propane tank through the retaining wall and flipped over. 
anyway, so I had to buy another dump truck. So I, I well, dump like it, it sounded like you had to <laughs> a good use for that insurance that you were having trouble on. Oh, so so <laughs> yeah, so so I'm talking to my neighbor. I'm sorry about wiping out your your uh, carport, but uh, I'll go get my wrecker and pull this thing out. And he says, well, let me call my insurance company. And he calls the insurance company and say, don't let him anywhere near that, <laughs> your place. <laughs> so anyway, so I have the wrecker, the dump truck. I have a 1954 M211, which is a Korean era, deuce and a half. I have a Humvee, which is the Marine Corps Humvee. I have a thing called a mule, an M274 mule. It's a four-wheel drive. Uh, four-wheel steering, actually, a little, tiny little military vehicle. It weighs about a half a ton. And I have a Hummer, which is different from a Humvee. It's a commercial version. And then I have um, oh, a bunch of ATVs. I have uh, a loader scraper, a backhoe, a, a 1948 case tractor, and I have a number of cars. I have a, uh, four Mustangs. I have one I bought in 1968. I'm, it's a one-owner car. I bought it new in 68. It's got like 250,000 miles on it. I've got a 65 Mustang convertible, um, uh, 2012 GT500. I've got a 2018 Mustang convertible. I've got a 1993 Corvette I bought new. We have a Lincoln Town car. We have a Dodge Dakota. Anyway, I, I'm MG Midget. So, and, and then when we bought the place, it was just a house. But my brother builds stuff. So he comes out, we build a garage. He comes out again, we build my office. He comes out again, we build a barn. He comes out again, we build a truck port. And so, so we've re, we built or rebuilt everything there except the main house. And so. <laughs> You keep all these things working, all these vehicles um, uh, operational. Yeah, I do engine rebuilding. I do, I don't do body work, and and I have my own forklift because we shop at Costco. But yeah, I do all the maintenance on all that stuff mostly. I, I mean, we take it to Jiffy Lube for oil changes and stuff like that, just because I'd never get around to it. Yeah. But yeah, I do I do all that. I, I changed the clutch in my five-ton dump truck, which is interesting because the transfer case probably weighs a thousand pounds. I rebuilt the differential in my the, so it turns out tractors are different the way they do brakes. They're, they they have uh, wet braking inside the differential, and so I bought a, a Cat 416D, which is a loader scraper combination that's a pretty heavy vehicle and it turned out the brakes were going out on it so I had to drop the the whole back axle now a wheel on one of those things is 24 inches you know they're I mean they're four feet tall or something and they're full of water so first of all you have to empty out the water because otherwise you could get crushed just taking a wheel off but so I take the wheels off take the differential out and it weighs probably nearly a ton disassemble that thing, get all the brake plates out of there, go down to the cat people and buy all the parts, put it all back together in my garage and put it back together. So that's all on Facebook actually. I've got pictures on Facebook for <laughs> doing that. So yeah, that's my place. I, I, we both love it out there. My wife's now a hermit. Um, so are you doing are you doing technical stuff now? Are you consulting or what? Yeah, well, I'm still doing this startup company. I'm still oh, yeah. working with Silicon Catalyst, and so those are your two outside. Yeah, these are both unpaid. Well, and I'm still doing university accreditation, and right. and George just came to visit me again, and he said, "Hey, I'm thinking of starting the newsletters back up, and I want you to write one of them." And so, so I went through the same thing with him again. I said, well, you know, the topics that you're suggesting here are just like the last time we talked. They're not quite the right set. You know, I think you know what happened in the computer business with the invention of the PC, how it just, everything became standard interfaces and, and the, the, the whole industry blossomed off of standardization and competition. 
that same transformation needs to take place in mechanical engineering and in specifically in three areas. One of them is prosthetics, robotics, and, and vehicles. And I saw this in the Army Science Board when I, I did a study on robotics. And this was 10 or 15 years ago now. I went and studied what robots the Army was using at the time. And at the time, the Army had like 100 robots. And every single one of them was a unique robot. That's insanity personified because that kills people. I mean, first of all, if you've got 100 robots that are top to bottom integrated, there are 100 different supply chains for all those robots. In addition to that, you give a convoy a robot, and so here's a whole convoy of supplies going somewhere. They run into an IED or a suspected IED. Okay, break out the robot and go check that out. Well, this isn't the IED robot. You know, this is the uh, unexploded ordnance robot. And so what happens then? The whole column, the whole supply column gets stalled while they find out where the IED robot is and bring it in on a helicopter. That can be six hours. It could not even, might not even be in the same country. What you really need is a reconfigurable robot something that's modular, that's got components that are, you know, so that I go back and here's my robot kit and there's an instruction manual with it that says, for an IED, plug these interfaces together and right. send the thing out. Yeah. And so there's a big transformation coming. All of mechanical engineering needs a complete overhaul. And there's a guy in, in Austin, Texas, at the University of Texas. He wasn't there when I was there, but I met him on the Army Science Board, mm -hmm. and I got to know him when we were doing the robotics study because I said, you guys are asking the wrong question. You know, what really needs to happen here is this modularization and this, you know, transformation in robotics. And so uh, this is in a big meeting with the, the Army Science Board. I say, okay, so... Dale and I will write the counter opinion, the, what do they call it, the minority report for this. And Dale's sitting over there going, what? <laughs> but he's been doing, he's a mechanical engineering mm -hmm. in, engineer in robotics who's been working in the field for 40 years, and he knows exactly what needs to be done. And so he and I wrote the minority report for that thing. And th that was a typical a couple of typical things happen on these Army Science Board reports. If you confirm the thing that the Army wants to hear, then they'll publish your report. Mm -hmm. And if you come up with conclusions that they don't agree with, they will bury it. I actually had a two-star general come to one of my presentations specifically to filibuster so that I couldn't present the results. And that was a study on the you know, what's the next communication system they were going to field for the Army? Mm -hmm. And I said, there are two major things wrong with this. First of all, you've got a 15-year fielding plan. From the time the first unit gets the new devices till the time the last unit gets the new devices is going to be 15 years. That thing's going to be obsolete in two years. You'll never even get three years into your fielding plan before this is no good. The second bad thing you've done is you've got these things called key performance parameters. They say we've got five key performance parameters that this thing has to meet. And so what the Army does is say, okay, we're going to set what these parameters are and you're going to design to those parameters. And I'm like, that's not a good idea because what you're talking about is radios. And radios are what the cellular guys are doing right now. And you've got five of these parameters they're not defined right now, but two years from now, at least three of those are going to be defined by the cell phone guys. And you're not going to be compatible with that. And so what you really need to do is start down this path using the knowledge that you have right now with the confidence that those guys are going to define these parameters before you get to the end point. Because otherwise, you're going the wrong way. And so the guy came to filibuster my presentation because... He wanted to see the other plan. No, it's worse than that. It's like, I don't care how bad this plan is. If, if I let this information out that this, it's no good, the Navy will take our money. Yeah. <laughs> so 
we're going to spend it on this garbage. <laughs> yeah, so, that happens a lot. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's probably more than I should have said, <laughs> but a lot. <laughs> it's a fascinating story. <laughs> It's more twists and turns than I had. Uh, <laughs> I, in, uh, in what little information was available, it was like, wow, this is uh, much more typical. <laughs> It's broader well, than I had anticipated. I hope it's entertaining enough that oh, somebody will uh, watch it. It's actually very interesting, very entertaining. Uh, you've so. had uh, quite a unique experience. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll find something I can do. <laughs> The trouble is there are too many things that you can do. <laughs> Finding something to do is not the problem. It's, <laughs> right. as your wife says, learning to say no yeah, is the yeah, problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she screens my phone calls for that very reason. No, she, she doesn't want to talk to you. <laughs> that's right. She says, you know, he's not taking any more expert witness testimony. He's not going to do it anymore. So she's trying to say no for me. <laughs> All right, Nick, thank you very, very much.